I'd like to call the Budget and Public Employees hearing to order. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, we have just, let's see, one item, uh, no, excuse me, we have several items on our agenda today. We will be um, hearing, of course, board bill number one, but we will also be hearing from Alderwoman Schweitzer on board bill number 46. And I believe that might be it. Um, we had a couple of additional board bills that we were asked to hear this week. I'm not sure why they're not on our calendar, but um, uh, Madam Clerk, could you double check that these are the only two items on our calendar for today? Okay, thank you so much. Um, with that, um, Alderwoman Schweitzer, do you want to take up your bill first so we can get that out of the way before we go into the budget? That's a great idea. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here with you all today. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you mind reading the introduction, or the summary, rather, of Board Bill number 46? Is your mic not working? It wasn't. That's okay. You can just start over. Thank you. Do I come up here? You can sit. You can sit. You can join us if you like. Wonderful. <laughs> Board Bill Number 46, introduced by Alderwoman Ann Schweitzer, an ordinance relating to the appointment of and salaries of certain employees in the Collector of Revenues Office, pursuant to Section 82610, Revised Status of Missouri, by repealing Ordinance Number 71508, allocating certain other employees to a grade with rate and including an emergency clause. The provisions of the sections contained in this ordinance shall be effective with the start of the first pay period following approval by the mayor. Thank you so much. So as the clerk read, this board bill is for the Collector of Revenues Office, and what it does is it takes that same 3% pay increase that city employees received and makes sure that uh, employees in the Collector of Revenues Office are also able to receive that same increase. Um, this is something that has been planned for in the Collector of Revenues budget and uh, is something that I support making sure happens for, for those employees who work hard serving our city. Thank you. I ask for your favorable consideration of the bill. With that, I'll turn it over to the committee for questions. Uh, Alderwoman Sonier. Um, I don't... I don't, I don't have any questions. It looks like this is just a normal budget with the regular raises that we're giving everyone within the city, you know, all of our staff. Exactly right, yes, it's exactly what it does. Okay, yeah. I Thank you. Okay. Alderman Aldrich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to clarify, this will not uh, affect the city budget, correct? This will be something that the Collector of Revenues Office absorbs, yes. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you add me as a co-sponsor? No questions. Thank you. Will do. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Alderwoman Schweitzer. Just for clarity, I'm looking at the bill online. I don't see a fiscal note associated with it. Was there one prepared? Or do we need one because there's no... I is, think we don't need one because it's not general revenue fund. It's coming from the collector's office. But I will make sure that um, the committee gets any other fiscal information okay. that it needs. If there, Yeah, just, I just for uh, compliance, if we needed to include a zero one. 
we're good. Okay. Fantastic. So then there would be a net zero impact uh, yes, on the yes. financial stuff. Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. Well, um, with, with that, I will entertain a motion to pass Board Bill 46 with the due pass recommendation. Motion to pass Board Bill 46 with the due pass recommendation. Second. With that, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderwoman Schweitzer. Aye. Alderwoman Sanye. Aye. Alderman Aldrich. Aye. Chair Spencer. Aye. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Oldenburg. We have four aye votes. I believe that's passed. Yes. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, all right, thank you, Alderwoman Schweitzer. Okay, we've dispensed of line item one, uh, and we have no approval of the minutes. Um, we do have, um, I'd be remiss, I think we had one excused absence. I'd take a motion to excuse the alderman from whatever ward Oldenburg is from. Two. Two, okay, alder the alderman from the second. Is there a motion to excuse? Motion to excuse the alderman from the second ward. I'll second that motion. Uh, any objections to previous roll? Hearing no objections, we've excused the alderman from the second. Are we excusing? Are, she's not, she just messaged me that she's on her way. Thank uh, you. Okay. Okay. Oh, she said she had called earlier. Apparently it didn't work. Okay, uh, now we'll move on to item number two, which is board bill number one, which is our city's budget. Today we'll be um, presenting or having discussion about ads and minuses. Today is Wednesday, June 7th, um, and I expect uh, that tomorrow we'll be taking votes on these uh, matters. So with that, what I'll do. Perfect is, question. Mm -hmm. Is there um, a reason we're not comfortable doing it today? Taking the votes? Yeah. Well, I think um, I, after giving some thought, um, I think for one, to give a little extra time in preparing, but number two, I think once we start to discuss cuts and minuses, um, that's a matter that should have some level of public um, you know, discourse. I think it, it would behoove us to just allow for 24 hours before taking a vote while we're considering the, the, the matters. And that way, if there's any additional facts or any additional things that we need to kind of gather, we can we have at least 24 hours to kind of do that. I appreciate small that. Level of due diligence. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to the committee for discussion on any proposed changes to Board Bill Number One. Uh, in order of seniority, Alderwoman Schweitzer. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. This has been a really enlightening uh, experience for me. I've never been on this committee before. This is my first first time on it, and it was illuminating, really, to hear from the budget division and the various departments about what they're asking for and what is needed. And you know, we've seen through this these presentations that there are so many situations in the city that are operating um, in sort of um, emergency mode all the time, uh, whether it's talking about our sewer lateral program, which we know is 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 um, only able to cover emergency repairs with the money allocated in the budget, uh, whether it's forestry, uh, not being able to keep up with the number of trees that need to be cut and trimmed, uh, whether it's the health department asking for a receptionist because right now aldermen are told to direct their animal control issues directly to the director. Uh, we can see that there are some, some real, um, I would say emergency situations happening in the city. There are some things that I, I love about this budget. Uh, I love the $3.9 million that's going to in, uh, improve the siren system. I really am happy to see the Office of Violence Prevention uh, coalesce so many of the services under that roof. I think that makes a lot of sense and is such an important thing that the city is doing right now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about 
about the changes that we've made to the Board of Aldermen over the last year to better serve uh, the city and am really looking forward to hearing what my, my colleagues think in terms of, of line item numbers. Um, you know, I think one of the hardest things about this, this position that we're in right now is having to suggest cuts. The way the process works is we suggest what should be cut and where it should go. And one of the things that I think I've really focused on during this, during this process is, you know, how much money is really coming into the city. We talk a lot, I've talked to Chairwoman Spencer about this and everyone on the committee about the need to increase the amount of money that's coming in. You know, that, that, is, um, that is something that is clear. I mean, with the uh, vacant buildings, for example, we know that there are so many more vacant buildings in the city that aren't being fined for uh, the vacant uh, building fees that can be collected twice a year. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of revenue that the city is missing out on. And I, I can speak for myself and, and I think many others and how much time we all take dealing with vacant properties in our neighborhoods, whether that's the aldermen, the NIS, the building division, the forestry, the police, health and human services. I'm not you know, sure that really there's that much of city government that that, that issue doesn't touch and impact negatively to a point that it, you know, we need to make sure that if there are vacant buildings in our city that, are, that meet the, the qualifications to be on the vacant building fee list, that they're on it and those fees are being collected in every other um, um, every other fee that the city should be enforcing. I mean, I think we all want to see enforcement of, of the codes and, and the rules of the city, and that um, is something that can also help the city financially, uh, and I think overall improve. As those conditions improve, so, the, so the needs of those areas will lessen as well. So it's, it's a win-win for everyone, I believe. Um, and so like I said, and you know, when we're talking about what can be cut, uh, that's that's a that's a tough position to be in uh, when so many departments need every dollar, and most of the departments told us when they presented that they asked for more and they were denied um, positions that they believe are really important to their services. So you know that's where we're starting this conversation, which is not not a. a um, a super fun place to start, if you will. Uh, and so that all said, some of the suggestions that I have, uh, and I, um, when I th thought about what could be cut, I wanted to look at the areas that have seen the most increase in budget, and you know, one of those places is within the Board of Aldermen itself. Um, we had a $900,000 increase to the Board of Aldermen budget, and that's after losing 14 aldermen and going to a different uh, system of government. And while I think, I first wanna say that I think the Board of Aldermen operates better today than it has since I've seen the Board of Aldermen operate as someone who paid attention to politics and the board, and then now as someone on the board, the amount that the board has improved with the staff that it has uh, is, is incredible, and the staff deserves every bit of, of thanks and praise for that. Um, that said, I do think there are a few positions in the board that I would be interested in looking, considering cutting uh, going forward into this next budget year in order to find, um, uh, you know, over $500,000 um, of money in the board, which we know there's so many places that this money is needed. Um, so, one of those things is the uh, aid sergeant at arms position right now that's budgeted at 49,000 um, and 10 for salary with benefits amounting to about 22,958. Uh, that brings $71,968 of revenue to uh, zero. So putting that back into circulation. Um, and then as well as keeping our five, we currently have five executive secretaries working at the Board of Aldermen. We're budgeted to go up to seven. I think we should stay at five, um, especially with the influx of legislative assistance at the board. Um, you know, I think that that is, that is something that there will be a lot more folks helping aldermen uh, and I think that will be make that possible to have the legislative assistance taking on and helping out with secretaries so that five would be in a, a good amount for the board to have. Um, 
I had thought about the receptionist position that is currently being hired for at the board as well, but one of the things that's happening now is that our secretaries are rotating through uh, being there and, and other staff of the board, quite frankly, are rotating through and acting as receptionist right now. Um, so if we do hire for that position, that gives back a lot of time to the executive secretaries, making that um, five to seven, seven to five position cut even make even more sense. Um, and that brings the numbers uh, from uh, seventy-two thousand dollars, four hundred eighty-eight. Uh, I need to look at that number a little bit more to make sure I'm giving you all the right number for that. Um, but I, those are two of the things that I suggested. And then the last one um, is going from uh, suggested two research analyst positions in the in the president's office to one uh, research analyst position. Uh, and I want to hear more from the president's office about, about that proposal because I, I haven't been able to talk with them about that. But right now we have zero research analysts hired in the, in the president's office and perhaps just one would be sufficient, um, especially as our financial analyst has been hugely helpful to the board already that perhaps just one more person in, that, in a uh, research position at the, in the, in the working for the board would be sufficient, especially with the addition of 14 legislative assistants, which I'm hoping are able to share a lot of this work. Um, so those are my three suggestions for places to find cuts. And then also in terms of putting that money somewhere else in the budget, I'm very open to the conversations that my colleagues want to have about that. Some of the places that I personally feel strongest about um, is the sewer lateral program, uh, the cutting down trees with forestry getting um, dead and uh, damaged trees cut ex uh, in an expeditious way so we can get more trees planted, so we can be prepared for the future, um, as well as uh, helping in the health department with the receptionist position there. Um, those are the three places that you know I would want to add some money to the budget uh, off right off the bat. Um, some other needs I do I think are really important is, you know, I, I think we have money in the Board of Aldermen budget now. Um, for IT upgrades, and I know that we're going to be spending a lot on on that. Uh, and I don't know if some of that money can cover some of the, uh, you know, facilities here with microphones and everything. I'm hoping that's part of it. Um, but if it doesn't, then I do think that there are some equipment upgrades needed for STL TV. Um, so those are those are my my main things. Thank you for entertaining me uh, and my suggestions. And I really look forward to hearing from all of you. Um, I feel like this should be a collaborative process, which is why I didn't have you know this is where exactly where I want this money to go um, here today because I, I my impression of our meeting today and I'm I'm glad that's what we're doing is talking about what people see the needs at, are and, and making a decision in a collaborative way. I think that's um, where we get better legislation, quite frankly. So thank you so much, Madam Chair, for your time, and thank you, members of the committee, for yours. Thank you, Alderwoman Schweitzer. I think uh, to move through this process, what we'll do is give every member of the committee an opportunity to kind of speak and then maybe ask questions of the person who's speaking. So with that, um, I did have a, um, I'd like to turn it over to, to questions from the committee about uh, the discussion put forward by Alderwoman Schweitzer. Alderwoman Sonier, um, do you have any questions or thoughts to add to the discussion? For sure. Um, the, for the positions like the sergeant um, or the aide, have you talked to Clark Kennedy and other staff about what the impacts would be for them? Yeah, I have talked to Clark Kennedy about that This just, just today about it and um, I, uh, we spoke with the president yesterday. Um, the position, my understanding is the position is to uh, be available during meetings to kind of usher folks to different places if we have speakers or if we have, um, you know, a need to show, tell people the directions and to be present during the, the, the board meetings. And um, frankly, it didn't sound like a position that we really needed to me. Um, and I, you know, from discussions with them, it wasn't something that they were like, if you cut this, we will not function. It was more like, yeah, that's, you know, something we'd like, but it's not something that is um, crucial to the operation of the board. 
Uh, I do think, again, since we're going to have 14 more legislative assistants and this job is that kind of role of directing folks and um, is really needed during the board meetings and, and, you know, that's something that I know if I had a legislative assistant and we took turns that, you know, every 14th meeting is your legislative assistant's turn to play host. Um, to the group, like that's something that I think would be a great, I mean, I think more ex exposure to all of us to the public is a good thing. So um, I do think since we're going to have 14 more people who I hope are working in a collaborative fashion, um, that that sort of position that didn't really seem to be an everyday need could be something that could be absorbed as we add 14 legislative assistants. So, so from my understanding, the, the sergeant, um, the, the, the sergeant at arms was combined, like in the line item, it even says slash aid, because it used to be an aid position. Um, in the conversations that I had, I was told that that was a needed position, um, that their duty isn't just, like that would be one of the things is to assist us in our meetings, but also some of the other administrative tags as far as um, helping to set up meetings, doing some of the um, filing work, um, doing some of, like basically the clerical and administrative side of work for setting up our meetings and doing those things, things that it's probably, you know, I would say a legislative assistant who's assigned to a specific alder probably isn't the best to do because that person sees a lot of information first ahead. And then also I'm leery to, to make assumptions about what the legislative assistants can do since ultimately that's up to each alder, what they ask you know, what the legislative assistant could do. And I don't, I don't know, every community is different. I've heard some of us say that the legislative assistant will spend a lot of time in community. They don't necessarily see it as being just something here. So it also makes me nervous to build, you know, to build around a position that is not, it, it will be largely up to each alder and each of our wards and communities and needs and leadership styles are so different. I don't know what, what they will be doing, you know, uh, yeah. Um, so. That would be my thing. I would want to hear from Clerk Kennedy and from staff who that would directly impact about if they feel like that's a need. I, I also don't want us to like step outside of our bounds as alders. I don't think we know all the full detail of what insists on their side of things. And what I do know is they are working two or three positions, a lot of them right now. And so, you know, they're working on the weekends when we call these public meetings and, and they're understaffed, uh, understaffed severely. So I just, I feel like I want to hear from them and I don't, I don't even know how that works since technically they are officially staffed. But before we cut things that they may need and say what they need, I would love to know how, you know, what, what are their thoughts? What are they feeling? Do they feel like there's a need? Because I know that I see them well after five o'clock often. I see them on the weekends and I know that they're at least doing two, some are doing two or three positions right now be, and because of understaffing and have told me, not through a budget conversation, but in general that they were looking forward to us getting fully staffed so that they could have a more reasonable workload. Can I respond? Sure. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I hear you and I think that is why the receptionist position wasn't one that I thought we should cut from the board um, because that receptionist can handle, I think, a lot of things as well, especially with the executive secretaries no longer needing to rotate through that position, which I do think is one of the workload pieces that I've seen our secretaries take on that is probably really not their role. Um, you know, as I said in the beginning, you know, it's not, this part is not the fun part of the job in terms of like, what do we think we can do without? And that is a situation in which the Board of Aldermen's budget went up you know, almost a million dollars. Um, uh, and that is a pretty huge increase um, with 14 less aldermen. And I do think that I give all of the credit in the world to the president's office and their clerk's office for how professional uh, the board has been run over the last several months. It's been a huge improvement. Um, you know, the board has never had a sergeant of arms. The improvements in the board already with the staff that are, are currently working here has been uh, phenomenal and enormous um, and it's just not a position we've ever had so I don't know that it's a position we need especially with the addition of 14 more staff um, and and I, I hear you that not you know every um, I mean because it's up to it's up to the auditor's discretion you really I think what, what I've seen in budget is the systems and the processes are in place. So if you start to rebuild a system, and I know that's what we're here to do, but if we rebuild it around 14 positions that are up to each individual alder's discretion on what their person will do, and each individual alder has their own you know, version and in their own needs, I think that makes sense because we represent different parts of the city, our constituents need different things. So I don't really wanna build it around 
13 other people who I don't know what their expectations would be. What I can say is I could definitely use the help and whoever ends up being my legislative assistant will have a, a full load and it would be great if they were able to focus on the things that I could I could really use, use help with with us. Again, I wasn't even here when it was smaller, but I know just being here since we have a lot of work to do with committee work, a lot of work to do to build, rebuild infrastructure in our wards, but also I'm not sure maybe um, um, Mr. Nelson, who's the chief of staff for the president's office is here. Maybe he can speak to the sergeant of arms and what that position does, like their duty, so we can kind of have a better idea, because a better idea of maybe, you know, whether or not the necessity of it. I understand, and I think everybody needs to be convinced in their own time for every single decision that's made here today. I mean, that's what we're doing is trying to figure out, you know, if we think that there are certain things that might be needed more than what's currently here. And that's the whole thing that we're doing. Um, so to me, you know, I see the needs of, you know, that but that number could be moved right over to the health department for their receptionists, who so that Dr. Mahdi isn't fielding, um, isn't fielding animal control calls, which she has two of mine in the last three weeks. Um, so I know she needs the help and is doing the work. And you know, um, I hear you completely. And and you know, if if legislative assistants and the aldermen who have, you know, who are working with them. Do not try to make them available to the board as when there are times of need at the board and when people need to be all hands on deck. I mean, there's a lot of times every department is all hands on deck. That's how we do things to get things done in the city and on the board. Um, and uh, I would expect my legislative assistant to be there to help when there are times that help is needed. And I, I know I cannot ask that of everyone. Of course I can't. Um, but I know that we've seen um, you know, there's always going to be different amounts that someone is willing to contribute and help. Um, you know, I don't, I, you know, I, I didn't really have a secretary at all in the last session because my secretary didn't help me at all. I mean, it was, it was a non-existent thing. Um, so I know how helpful and wonderful it is now to have a secretary who is incredible and gets things done and pitches in and is part of a team. Um, and I think that, you know, in, in my mind, the legislative assistant is part of that team. Um, and perhaps it's worth further defining in personnel, and that would be up to the personnel committee. And of course, you know, uh, Rasheen's here and can, or sorry, Alderman Aldridge is here. Apologize about that. Um, so used to calling you Sheen Bean. <laughs> I'll never do that again, sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think it is, of course, it's worth having the conversation. But um, yeah, I just, you know, to me again, the Board of Alderman budget went up $900,000. Um, I think there are other places that, that frankly, need the money more. Um, because, yeah, I, I yeah, agree. That's I, where I'm at. I, I understand. I just, I'm not sure if that's okay, Madam Chair. I just, for me, I don't want to make decisions for workloads that we don't do. At the end of the day, I'm not Clerk Kennedy. I'm not Aura. I don't, I don't have a good idea of all the way what they're missing, what their need, what their duties are day to day, how overwhelmed they would be. I, I can't make that call. I can only speak to my experience as an alder. So I would like someone who can speak. More I think to that what makes sense. So, it, yeah, I think this is an excellent point, and this is a really tough part of the budget. Whenever we're trying or considering making cuts, and you know, um, going back to kind of why we're having this conversation today and not taking a vote on these. This is, you know, having these discussions, you bring up a great point about having conversations um, with the department. We're in a very unfortunate position with regards to the Board of Aldermen's budget because we haven't heard the Board of Aldermen's budget before us, which is extremely unusual for us to be sitting here in this position and not having heard the budget from our own department. Um, and so, you know, I mean, we, we've been having hearings for three weeks and most departments have, you know, accommodated and find, found a place in the schedule to kind of come before us. I recognize that our staff has done an incredible job organizing all this and, and, and you know, it is difficult sometimes to find a spot, but we have not heard our own budget. And so these questions really should have been answered before we were here today. Um, that being said. Uh, Madam um, Chair, could I jump in? Sure. Because uh, I, you know, I've, I'm taking the lead of Alderwoman Shamim Clark Hubbard because we are on TV, and I always want to be, um, you know, for for the public that 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 we are being as clear as possible. I, I agree. We have not heard. I know last week, uh, Madam President was sick. 
um, and I know her staff was ready. And I know um, I did mention that to you that the staff was ready to present that day, and you insisted that you know we wait another time. But I will say the staff uh, was ready, even though the president was sick. Um, I've been in this role for a short time. Um, um, I've even going back to Alderwoman uh, Schweitzer's comment of saying haven't been able to talk. I, I know this office has been accessible as possible. Every time you know I pick up uh, or try to reach out, they are they are there to um, you know try to communicate. Um, I know we frequently talk with uh, the president about our legislation. I think at the same time we can also talk about budget items, but I'll save that more for uh, my comment with Alderman Schweitzer. But I did, I'd wanted to go on record that. Um, when the president was sick, you know, I did mention that the staff was ready and you rather waited to the president was here um, to actually present it, but the staff was ready to present the day of when the president was scheduled. Yeah, you, you, you had mentioned that. We had already canceled it. I'd received the cancellation notice from the president's office at that time. Of course, we've been available this week as well. Um, you know, continuing to have hearings. That being said, I appreciate that level of clarification. I mean, you know, typically, um, you know, as mentioned by the mem many members of the general public, we, we kind of get, you know, these hearings going. It happens every year at the exact same time. Um, and it's important to hear from all of our city departments. I am extremely grateful that every department that we have asked just about has, you know, you come before us, and that's a big lift. And I am really impressed and grateful for this committee who has showed up and been here and been present uh, through the vast majority of very arduous hearings, and here we are um, right now. That being said, because we're talking about the Board of Aldermen's budget, and we haven't heard from the Board of Aldermen um, from their budget, we do have a member of their staff who was available last week, and perhaps if, if the committee would be amenable to having um, Mr. Nelson come and answer a couple of those questions. That'd be great. That That's would, what I would like. Would, is, uh, Mr. Nelson, would you be uh, willing to do that for us here this morning? Okay. Um, you know, I, I, the Board of Aldermen's budget has gone up extremely significantly in the last couple of years, looking at um, an increase from about 3.2 million to, where are we at this year? for the Board of Alderman budget? Five. Point nine. All right, three point, going from 3.3 .3 million to 5.9 million. Um, and one thing that's not clear to me is kind of how the staffing works. Um, how, if you could explain how in, the staffing has shifted um, from last year to this year, I know that there has been some discussion about expansion of the office space Correct. to accommodate the president's staff, et cetera. If you could explain kind of how these, um, how, how in general the, the staffing has shifted for the board. Yes, ma'am. So thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. So for the president's office. Can you introduce yourself to? Yes, Jay Nelson, Chief of Staff to President Megan Green, Board of Aldermen. Um, so for the president's office, two positions were added to the president's um, ENA approved those um, recommendations earlier in the year. Those two positions are associate uh, policy associates, which both positions are currently filled. Um, I did want to speak to the legislative researcher's position. But can, mm -hmm. can you? I'm sorry. Can you clarify? So the board of ENA, um, the board of ENA uh, approved the recommendations for two new positions to the president's office, and they're in the recommended budget, but they but they have not been approved. Is that correct? No, so earlier when President Green took office, she requested a table organization change at ENA to add two additional positions to her office. Those positions are policy, policy associates. ENA approved those two positions, and those positions are currently in this FY budget. Okay, and those are, I, I don't know that I understand all this grade yeah, level. Yeah, the way are our they? ordinances work, we give titles to individuals, but the actual name of it is not the same. So that would be uh, secretary to the president. The secretary to the president. Well, those the, two. I'm the secretary to the president. So uh, there is special assistant to the president. Special assistant secretary to, the, to president. the president. And then there are. Three of, I'm, I, Jay, I'm looking at page three of the line item detail. Is that what you're looking at for the? Yes, ma'am. Say that again. So you have the secretary to the president. You have the special assistance to the president. 
the secretary to the president, the special assistant to the president. Okay. The special uh, assistant to the president would be identified as the chief of staff. The special assistant to the president is the chief of staff? Correct. And the two, and the two added are the secret. What are the poli Where are the policy positions that you mentioned that are new that have already been hired? So when you look at, I'm looking right now. So you got the secretary to the president, which is grade 15 G. Okay. There, um, there are budgeted for two positions there. That line item comes to a total of 109. So those two positions would be identified as our Secretary of Engagement, which is Yusuf Denshire, and our Director of Operations, which is Christina Gracia. And then... Mm -hmm. Two positions together make 109? Yes. Um, the reported salaries for those two positions are don't jive with that number in my recollection. I'm sorry? The... the, the I thought they were nine. I thought they were ninety, and it, that was what was reported in the post dispatch. No, ma'am. Um, so what was reported in the post dispatch was our legislative, our policy director, which is Christina Garmendia, which we have not addressed her position yet. So if we want to go by what each of the staff. No, no, no. I don't. I don't. Made, I don't. I just want to make sure that we're looking at the right line yes, items. Is all because I, I. I mean, I, so I don't want to go through. Yes, ma'am. So when you look at line item uh, grade zero 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 legislative director. You'll see that for 91,000, that's the position that you're referring to from that was reported from the post dispatch. That is our policy director position. So, grade zero zero zero. Okay, so those were the director. those were the two that were added to the president's office. No, so the two that were added to the president's office, and I'm looking at it right now to give you the exact line item. Give me one quick second, Madam Chairwoman. I want to make sure I'm giving you the right information. So when you see, uh, you'll see default grade, it says admit, no, that's not correct, that's admit assistant to the Board of Aldermen. I'm looking for our other two positions here. There it is, grade 16M, admin assistant to the president. You'll see that there's two requested there, and that's a total of 169,988. Those include two of the added positions for our policy associates in the board uh, president's office. Those were the two that were added, okay. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, it took me a while to find that. Got you that screenshot of what I was mentioning with regards to the other piece. That's why I was asking for clarification. Um, okay, so the two, so broadly speaking, there's been two positions added to the president of the board's office and has the, and then what are the other staffing positions or the staffing changes, uh, just broadly speaking? Yes, ma'am. So uh, the previous administration also requested two additional positions to the board of aldermen. Those were the two positions that Alderwoman Swicer was referring to, the uh, research analyst. Mm -hmm. Those positions do not report to the president's office. Those positions would report to the Board of Aldermen and the Personnel Committee. Those positions are to help our current one legal counsel help prepare legislation and research for members of the board. A lot of the time, um, we have 14 different alder people asking one staff member to draft a bill for them to do the research and to do all of that heavy lifting and that could be burdensome. So those two positions were added previously in the past. Also, the 14 administrative assistant positions were added before our administration as well. We agree that this board, as it is changing, as um, we have been cut in half and wards have expanded, that it's important that all the people have the support to respond to constituent concerns, complaints, show up to all of these different neighborhood and community meetings that they're asked to do. So that, that position is in there as well. We are keeping our executive secretaries. They, are, they have been put in a tight position over the course of the last few uh, months where they, a lot of our staff are doing two or three different people jobs. 
Um, so when you actually look at our budget, most of our increases are to pay our staff what we believe they are worth um, as they are doing multiple jobs. And what we have done is we have done a survey with staff. Um, we have talked to staff. We have talked and met with the clerk. We have met with all of these different individuals to talk about these positions. So this is not something that we just decided we wanted to do. This is something that has been needed um, here at the Board of Aldermen. But I'm also available to talk through any other positions because as you are aware, the Board of Aldermen has not had a financial analyst for several years until now, um, which is Mr. Ryan Coleman. So we are actively working to staff up these positions so that this board can be staffed up to perform its duties to its public and to its constituents. Okay, that, so that, I just wanted to ask from a broad sense and then I'll turn it over to the committee for questions. Alderwoman Boyd. And I guess I'm, I'm just, I understand the city is going in a whole different direction. And so we're trying to, and I'm trying to think for the people who thought through this. <laughs> I know it is funny. And so I'm trying to think through how they thought. So their logic was we would have less older people and less, uh, but they would have more areas to cover. And I don't think they went past goal because they didn't look at that older person has doubled to what they were dealing with. And we do, we are looking at the legislative assistance, but I'm just, I don't want us to contradict what people were saying the city was trying to do. Mm -hmm. The city was trying to uh, look at streamlining how we do business. And so with this, I don't want us to say, yeah, you need to have an older person that covers more area, but we need to have more people down at City Hall for A, B, and C. And so we just need to be careful what we're doing because the residents are the ones who's going to suffer from this whole fiasco, fiasco that's going on. So that's who's suffering through this whole process. So it's, it's a lot, but I just think some positions we probably, if we haven't had them in years, we don't need them. The financial analysis, we've always said that we needed to make sure we filled that back. But some of the positions here, I don't think we need to. So that's just my opinion. Yes, ma'am. And if I can speak to that, what I can um, let you know is we have decreased the Board of Aldermen's budget. We have currently already cut two positions that will not be filled in this FY year. So if you look at line items, if you look at the information technology aid, we have zeroed that out. And then if you look at, um, this is page three of the Board of Aldermen's FY. So this is our personnel schedule yeah page three yep so we zeroed out our information technology aid which is grade zero 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 we also zeroed out the recorder position which is grade zero 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 i can also speak to other decreases we made in the budget we gave up our legal services account which was fifty thousand dollars those two positions i just mentioned equal ninety three thousand dollars in cuts we gave up another fifty thousand for our legal services account that we will not spend in this fy 24 budget year my salary has been cut by $18,000 in order to move money over to help support our staff. That's a cut that's been here in this budget. Other cuts goes, go towards our elected official expense account. That dropped drastically from 121 to 80,000. So what we have done is made close to $300,000 of cuts to our budget currently. Us. That's what we've done. Should have done. Uh, Alderwoman Boyd, or did you have any further questions? No, okay. Alderwoman Schweitzer. Thank you so much, and I'm so grateful that you came to share this information with us. That clarifies a lot of things that have been going on behind the scenes. Really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate you being here. I did also want to speak to, if I may, Madam Chairwoman, the Sergeant at Orange position, because I think there's some information that's just not known about that position exactly as well um, as, as you all were talking and discussing it. So currently, we have the marshals, our legislation, our ordinance says that the marshal shall be the sergeant at arms. What happened and what is the problem currently is that when the marshals went under SLMPD, they lost their subpoena power. 
So currently, if the Board of Aldermen wanted to issue a subpoena, there is no one to issue it on our behalf. We wanted to keep the sergeant at arms position as we will be working to fix our staffing ordinance. We plan to have that introduced before the board goes down on break in July, but we are looking at legal ways to try to determine how our sergeant at arms could potentially have the authority to issue subpoenas. Again, currently, the marshals cannot do it on our behalf anymore since they went under SLMPD. So that's why that position is important to keep because we will need someone to do that services outside Ever of just issued a subpoena we have not <laughs> issued a subpoena right. yeah i just don't I, I just don't i mean i really don't like that process anyway um and i think that um yeah I, I do have a few questions and i appreciate you being here and clarifying that that's the goal um you know i i appreciate everything you're saying and i uh, did not realize you had taken a, a salary cut or the position had and that is um admirable um yeah, I, I, I appreciate this. Um, the I share a lot of the same thoughts as Alderman Boyd. Um, you know, if we haven't had the position, I'm not sure we need it. Um, I would have agreed with not having the recorder. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't really understand what that is anyway. And then um, with information technology aid, that was, that's that is not that is a position that I could see having been important and I could see why you may have wanted it originally um, the questions I have really are um, about the numbers that you presented I think that the numbers that aren't here mm -hmm. I think you're underselling yourself a little bit because every position that's not being um, in the, that's not in the budget also isn't just the, the salary position right here, but it's the benefits and everything else. So you're probably underselling what you already cut by um, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars at least, which is again, very admirable and important. And I wanna just lift that up because I think at to Alderman Boyd's point, people did not expect the cut in the Board of Aldermen to result in higher costs for right. the Board of Aldermen. Um, you know, the expense account is something that, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be against cutting from aldermen in general anyway. I take the unaccountable uh, version and buy everything for anything I need for my ward, um, which is, you know, probably adds up to that amount um, as, as, as it is, but isn't an amount that I think is super hard to swallow either. I, I don't, I think that's something that we could consider as aldermen is getting rid of that expense account. Um, but I do think that the um, aid sergeant in arms I guess I'm going to continue to ask that we don't fill that position um, the executive secretary positions I think having the, the legislative assistance again will make a lot of that load lighter um, as well as making sure that we have a receptionist at the at the front desk somebody who can answer a lot of the other you know I had I was under the impression that sergeant of arms main role which is kind of a weekly thing would be to direct folks and that seems like something that our receptionist should be doing on on Fridays um, so yeah I, I appreciate your presentation and I understand that again like I said at the beginning any idea of cutting a budget is tough I appreciate the um, clarification that, that research assistants are uh -uh. to the these mics, <laughs> or we have to deal with a lot. Which that is in our budget as well. When you when you speak of the cost going up, um, tomorrow there will be contractors in here to address our technology upgrades. Um, what we have been brought is this board has not had major work done on it. Um, when I say board facilities, that is, uh, in, since the 60s, really. Yeah, you won't be finding me asking to cut upgrades I mean my god I I think that just the damage to our eardrums alone um, <laughs> yeah it's it's a, it's a tough and I can't even imagine how people are thinking what people are thinking at home um, so I would not be interested in cutting any financial any uh, uh, IT cut spends that the Board of Aldermen plans to make that's not something that I'd be interested in looking at gotcha. um, so those are those are my suggestions is you know maybe going going from two research analysts to one especially with having 14 legislative assistants you know I hope people choose to hire legislative assistants that can help them with their legislation that's in the title um, and then keeping going from seven executive secretaries to five and and not having a sergeant at arms but when I say seven to five executive secretaries that means keeping everyone we have currently and just going from seven positions to five um, and uh, I appreciate you presenting. That was really informational. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for always being easy to work with. Yes, ma'am.
Alderwoman Zonier. Um, I guess I have more questions about the sergeant at arms now. Yes, ma'am. Um, just curious about, you know, if we don't have that position, what would be missing? What What are this? the essential functions that that position serves? So we're currently having conversations where we would like to re-envision what that position does. So going back from what Alderwoman Schweitzer was talking about, when we cut our information technology aid and the recorder position, the recorder position is basically when we get sunshine requests, they manage our records. Um, that position obviously has not been filled. The clerk has been taking on a big chunk of that work while also trying to get our agendas prepared and everything else that we need. We want to re-envision those two positions we cut into the sergeant at arms position so that the person actually does more than just attend meetings on Friday. Okay. Um, and then I was curious too, just, uh, Ann also mentioned the subscriptions, and I know you talked a little bit about um, technology upgrades. One of the issues that we've been having with some of our meetings is we don't have the we haven't found the ability to do hybrid to be both in person and virtual. And I think that makes some of our meetings inaccessible to some folks because and it makes us have to choose either one, but then it means people can't, we aren't able to say, well, if you can't make the meeting in person, tune in. Will, are any of the information technology updates and things that will come in, will they address that issue? Yes, ma'am. So um, going back into tomorrow, we have, um, we will be meeting with facilities. We personnel committee approved the bid for the electrical work that will be needed in the Kennedy room and the chambers that's up to one, uh, 155,000. Um, the worldwide technology bid that the previous board approved was a $400,000 technology upgrade. So what you will see is new microphone systems, new cameras. We will have four uh, 86 inch TV screens in here for members of the public and members of the board who cannot attend the meeting. So that will give us the hybrid nature that you're speaking of. So. There, that meeting will take place tomorrow, and as we go into next week, um, it's, it's, we're very sure that all of our committee meetings will be going back virtual as that work will be taking place. It will start here in the Kennedy Room, mm -hmm. and as the board prepares to go down in, on July 14th, we then will head over to the chambers, which the chambers is a heavy load because um, it's confirmed there's asbestos in the floor. So we have to invade the entire chambers. We have to cut the carpet up. We have to take the electrical boxes that's next to your desks out, replace and do complete rewiring of the whole facility and then buy new carpet and place it back down and try to get this all accomplished before the board comes back September 15th from break. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, especially the, the hybrid option, I think, we have an obligation to be as accessible as possible to the public and when you have to choose one or the other and you know I was just a working girl myself it can be difficult to make some of our meetings that are doing work days like this one but it's a lot more easier if I can click a link and tune in and watch um, for the public so I'm glad to see that yes ma'am uh, Alderman Aldridge thank you madam chair uh, just more to comment um, you know I agree with uh, Alderman Alderwoman Schweitzer and you know this is a very speaking of technology can't even blow without it sounds like a hurricane um, don't even breathe is it you know this is this is a hard spot that we in to be you know trying to figure out especially after the chairwoman has really allowed us to really dig deep into the budget and figuring out areas that we can cut and you know I kind of similar to what all the woman uh, Pam Boyd said is you know I think when all the when when the public seen that we was going down uh, from 28 to 14 uh, they probably didn't expect to see the staff go up but I will say as a public uh, member with the 28 uh, all the people before we went down I think also what the public wanted to see is actual professional uh, alder people a body of government, as I always say, that's not like a WWE, um, not waiting uh, to the last minute on the floor to make amendments, to get drafted. I mean, some of the things that this body has done has just been, it's no way we could have got away with that at the state level. We are running on bare bones professionalism, and I believe um, in, the, in, the, in the time that I've been here, the staff has been tremendous, uh, really helping out our executive secretaries. Uh, currently, most of our executive secretaries have, what, three older people um, to 
just one executive secretary. Um, I piggybacking off what Alder Woman Sonye said, you know, I've spoke with Clerk Kennedy. Um, he's been doing this for a long time. He has, as we always say, that institutional knowledge. Um, as our elders say, you know, listen to the elders. And what I'm doing is listening to him. And he said this is a position when it comes to Sergeant at Arms that we need. Um, and I know he's talking with the president office, like you say, revision what that position can do. Um, you know, I believe that more executive secretaries is needed to be able to give a lift off of uh, the current ones that we got. Thank God that the, they're getting also a pay increase. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, cutting executive secretaries. I would propose, you know, maybe individual, all the people think about cutting their own LA if we really want to, you know, look in the mirror and save uh, money. But um, I, 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 I think this is, this is a, 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 a budget that needs to be, uh, have as much staff as we are the legislative branch of the city of St. Louis, not as much staff, but I think the few staff that we're adding is a small piece to make this board actually run professional. Um, and I can say it hasn't, and that's why I decided to run because it hasn't been running, not at individual alder people, but the system as a whole uh, at this board has not worked for the people. That's why the people said cut us in half. It hasn't worked, not just based off of all the people, but the systems in place. And I think um, staffing is a huge help to be able to bring up uh, this board to a level that we haven't operated in in a very long time. Thank you, Alderman Aldrich. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to Alderwoman Schweitzer's point, I mean, it is <clears throat> when we cut the board, I mean, we you know, communicated to the public that this was gonna be a cost savings. And we've really, ballooned here in a pretty significant way. And I, I, I know I'm getting communication from the general public about it. And um, so I really appreciate you, you know, kind of outlining some of those major staffing changes. I do think if, you know, we should consider, I, I would be the first to uh, consider either sharing or, or, or eliminating my legislative aid. You know, I've worked down here part-time <laughs> with a second job to make ends meet as a single mom for the last eight years, um, you know, sharing one secretary among six other alder people and not having any legislative aids. And, and, and you're right, it hasn't been easy, um, but certainly um, it's, been, it's been doable. Um, and it, you know, I, I didn't sign up for this job <laughs> for it to be easy. And we do need to professionalize our staff, um, but I, I'm hoping we can maybe, the, maybe you know, look for some ways to make some, if we are gonna consider making cuts, I mean, every single department in city government is making do with not enough. We have heard from department after department who comes before us and says, I asked for the bare bones. I did not put in my requested budget even what we need to function at the best that we can. And so I, I just, I, I, I think um, our staff is really commendable getting all these hearings together, ho holding, um, Holding, uh, holding court, so to speak, um, has been, in my opinion, done especially, exceptionally well through this process, and um, and uh, and I just, you know, recognizing where we are as a city with a revenue that's stagnant is is, is something we need to take into consideration. Jay, if you don't mind, um, one of the things that was really brought up, and I think a good point, um, you know, during our public, you know discussion on the budget, you know, we had decided at a, as a committee to have these hearings in person um, and that eliminated the hybrid approach for right now until we get that, um, until we get that uh, technology in place. But we, we, we as alders had the ability to kind of post on our social media and let our networks know, but we did, we, we to my knowledge, didn't have any, don't have any um, budget for communication to the general public. Excuse me. Um, is that something that goes to the president's office? How can we better commun? You know, is we need to better communicate to the public ways to 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 engage with this body. Um, you can see here. I'm glad there's one member of the public here, but there's you know, um, if you could speak to that, I, um, you know, if the board is going to have access to that or if that's part of this budget. Yes, ma'am. So it is a part of this budget. Um, and communication supply. So what has been happening behind the scenes with the clerks, ourselves, we have, it's two, two parts here. One is there is a constituent service software that we will be looking for 
Uh, we have been meeting with different um, companies to try to see what could work best for the board and individual older uh, people. We've seen some pretty exciting um, um, softwares that could help this board be a lot more present in the community. Um, obviously, that has to go out to bed. So that is a part of this budget. And the other part to that is a meeting management system, which will allow for our public to have better access to our meetings when they're not able to come in person or say they're not even able to have internet, internet access as well. So both are, uh, are budgeted for, and we have been actively working to uh, seek that help out, and we plan to go out to bid for both. Some of the cuts you mentioned, the, uh, what, the um, elected, the expense accounts, what are, can you, what are those? I don't even remember what they are. So I know each individual alderman has one, and I assume the president has one. What are those amounts? Correct. So it's all $5,000 for the expense account. That decreased simply because the board was cut into half. So okay. uh, that's why that line item dropped significantly. Um, but it did go up to $5,000 for each alder person in their expense account. And that, but that doesn't equal. And that also includes the president too, by the way. She does have an expense account as well. Okay, oh, okay, so I, okay. And the, w there's a couple of additional I line items that are, are new here, the mm -hmm. membership fees. Yes, what, what, are we member, what, what are we proposing to be members of? Mm -hmm. So when we talked about our legislative researchers position, which I, I'm glad that came up, we plan to purchase a subscription to Westlaw so that our counsel to the board can have better access to legal services. Um, he also has to fulfill a certain amount of obligations um, as far as keeping his law license. That will help pay for that as well. And subscriptions to individual things such as uh, uh, STL Today, the Business Journal. Some alders have come to us because they want to be a part of different national networks and, and groups. So we tried to budget for um, that as well, assuming that alders wanted to take advantage of being a part of different organizations such as Local Progress, and there's a, a list of them. And those would be available to all of us across the board, or is that? Yes, ma'am. That, That's the plan. And that is the proposal with this $30,000 membership fee? Yes, ma'am. And the major projects, are, is there any room, to, what I'm trying to get at, Jay, is I'm just kind of looking through here, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, I, I do see a really significant increase in our budget going from, you know, 3 million to 5.3, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's, <laughs> and, and so where can we, you know, where can we make, where can we tighten our belt? Because I'm sitting here going, uh, the tow department had inched up 1% in their right. budget and, you know, all these other departments that are serving very critical needs. Um, like St. Louis TV. Right, STL yeah, STL TV, yeah. you know. Um, and, you know, so we just say that again. Um, you know, and, and we're dealing with the budget as presented to us, you know, so we're, we're coming in at the end. But just trying to figure out, I know the members of the public are looking to us going, tight, you know, what that looks like. So if you had any recommendations on, on where that, you know, where we could. Yes, ma'am. So what I would recommend to the committee, um, I, I will stand in the position that we, like I said already, we do not want to cut our budget any further. We believe all of this is necessary in order for us to be a better legislative body, more accessible to the public, more accountable to them as well. So I will start there. But if I was going to give any recommendations, I think you started out pretty well. Uh, that's $65,000 if you give up your legislative assistant. I would also uh, internal services. We put money in that line item to give each other a uh, better opportunity instead of our forever stamp uh, process to give each other the ability to have a meter mailing process where they can reach more of their constituents in their ward. So we can we can cut that. That's a uh, $114,000, but that would lock access from other older people trying to communicate with their constituents instead of the way that we currently do it with 500 forever stamps. But that but would be my rec that would be my recommendation. The, I'm sorry, half the half of the older people don't even use those stamps. Correct. Yeah, so they, they don't even use those stamps. And I guess I, I'm looking at again as the public, we are increasing dollars and the promise was we would not. And and I just feel we haven't fulfilled what our commitment was to the public. Contrary to people's belief, uh, the Board of Aldermen was not a zoo. We were very professional. 
we had issues at times like any other legislative body, like Jefferson City, they had legislative issues. So I think the times have changed, and I'm going to say this again. You look at the building alone uh -huh. of what you all are trying to do, and I applaud you. You're trying to bring this building up to the 21st century. But in the meantime, we told, not me, a bill of goods was sold to the community and said, if we reduce the number of older people, it will be better. Mm -hmm. We have not done that. It is not better. And so now we're coming through the back door, adding things to budgets, and, and it's not making it better. It's, it's not making it better for our city because we're spending more money. So that, that's just my concern. I, one thing I don't like to do is mislead constituents. I'd rather be up front and tell them the truth. And so I just don't see where this has become a win-win for our community. Mm -hmm. So as, as the chair said, we're adding pieces to this puzzle, and so the cost is going up. Right. So I see, I recognize you all have cut some areas and said, you know, we need to cut some of these areas and these things are not you know, they're not beneficial to us. But I just have a problem when we have a position and we have to make responsibility for that position. So that's not making sense to me. So that's, that's just where I stand. And I'm sorry. It, it was just like, okay, I, I'm not going to keep BS in the community because we said it would be better and it's not helping them. So. I, I believe that we're currently in our early stages. We've been here for seven months now, um, and we've heard from members of the community. They like the direction that things are going. I think that we are trying to give this board the tools to continue that path forward. Uh, historically, this board has been underfunded. I get it. We're asking for more money. We had this conversation with the budget director as well, which is why we made cuts. So to Alderwoman Spencer's point, yeah, I, don't mind cutting more of our staff if that's what this committee wants to do. Um, however, I think that's more of a decision for the full board of aldermen because we voted on these positions on the first day of session this year. So we've already voted to approve these positions as well. So I think that we should give ourselves an opportunity to be better and do better for the public. If I could jump, jump in, because I think we're just jumping in at this point. Um, I do remember back in 2012, uh, however it was sold, I thought, me personally, it was, it was sold more as, again, a, a body that can act in a, a good form. Um, but I do have a question, or, or most of the increase, and, and thank you for that clarity, because I think that's important. We did pass a resolution, each one of us on this um, committee, and all members voted for these positions. Um, and I think, it was, if not mistaken, it was probably nobody that objected to it. Uh, interesting that we're talking about it now um, is majority of the increases if I'm looking at it is it salaries yes the majority of our budget um, increases is salaries um, that is increases to positions such as the uh, assistant administrative clerk the clerk legal counsel um, uh, receptionist pretty much all of our staff um, like I said if you look at their line items you would think that some of them are at that line item they are not they have not been paid adequately um, at all, and we would like to do better for them again, especially when multiple of them are doing three to four jobs, and they've been doing that for years. Um, yeah. And they haven't complained, and I think we should treat our staff a lot better. Yeah. Well, I, I want to uh, echo that. We always talk about living wages. I'm glad to see we're actually doing it, and, you know, I think if um, I would just suggest maybe we should look at, I think, if we don't want to have such a, a big boost, maybe this committee should relook at uh, legislative assistance. That is 14 folks. Um, it's not where I want to go because I know that we all need the help. Um, we, we talk about how wards are much bigger and we can't get here, we can't get there. Um, maybe that is uh, somewhere that we just want to look um, to maybe 
if individual alders or as a whole. Um, sorry. Alderwoman Sonia. <laughs> yeah. Out of professionalism here. No, it's okay. Um, I will say, you know, for me, um, part of what I think has happened is I think, you know, being new, I think there's a way that people operate it, and I don't know how the previous 28 alders did everything that they did with bare minimum support. But I think when I hear people saying that this isn't a, a professional board and we need to professionalize ourselves and update ourselves, I would agree because, I mean, there was 28 alders and one legal counsel, uh, four secretaries to one alder, no financial analyst to a legislative body that does have, is supposed to have a key role in a budgetary process and be able to make other financial decisions, no hybrid virtual options you know, all the way up into these things. So when I hear that, it's, it's not, you know, it's not a personal attack. I have a lot of respect for every single alder that served in a previous body because that, you know, they made it work. But at the same time, that shouldn't be our, our goal is to operate with the bare bones minimums. Whether you realize it or not, and sometimes it takes time to see those impacts. I mean, I was on the Board of Education, it was seven of us. We, we had an attorney to seven. Like, you, you have to have supportive roles to play the things so that you are not, you know, overworking your staff. And again, everyone is, is different, but you know, my constituents expect for me to look at systems, they expect for me to pass policies, they expect for me to come up with solutions. And if we don't have certain supportive roles, that's a lot harder. It makes it easier if I'm able to you know, be a local progress or some other legal entity where there's a group of people of electeds from all across the country and I can say, hey, in my city, we're talking about tenant bill of rights. What are you all doing there? And somebody can help you know, have those conversations with people who have experience and who have done that work. It helps if I can go to the attorney and the attorney to, instead of telling me hey you know I want to get to this but I've got nine other requests he can filter some of that work to some to some researchers and again that's important in general but especially in Missouri where we have to make sure that every single thing we pass is not going to be preempted because we know how the state gets down so you know respectfully I do think that it's important that we consider staffing and just because we've operated and I understand everybody's making cuts and everybody is having to make sacrifices but you do have to figure out if you're going to re-envision yourself as a body and we want to improve and make progress that's not to say that like I said all of the previous alders I tip my hat off to them especially the ones that used to have any you know any t any area within the ward that I have the pleasure of representing now because I'm learning firsthand how much they had on their hands and how much they made a dollar out of 15 cents. But if you keep doing that, your city is going to reflect that. You have to choose to invest in the services and invest in the staff. I know some cuts have to be happening, but also some improvements have to happen because I do feel as a member of the public, it has been challenging before, before I was a part of this body to get access and even down to the fact that the public doesn't always have access to the same information that we do in these seats. I often and have to follow up when we leave meetings and hey here's the attachment I had hey I'll scan you this file that I had in a meeting if we were a professional body I wouldn't be having to do that because we would have policies and processes and staff in place to take care of all of that but I often will do it because I see that they're already doing two or three positions and they're already overwhelmed but I also do want my constituents and sometimes it's not even my constituents they're just asking I see you're on this committee can I see what you were looking at so you know I do think that this is a a, a worthwhile investment and I think if you're going to choose to to cut things, everything has a cost and everything has an expense. And I do think that we can do better as a board and we can offer better services. And I think that having the ability to be a better a holistic board in terms of constituent services and in terms of policy and analysis and really looking at making sure you're, you're exercising every option that you can, I think that that is important um, in order to be good to our constituents. And I think that is doing a good job to be a good service to the public because I think the public has that expectation of us. Okay. Uh, any other further comments from uh, members of the committee? Uh, uh, <clears throat> okay, so Alderwoman Schweitzer, um, you have presented your thoughts on the budget. Do you, do you have any further, uh, we, we uh, uh, Jay, it sounds like we, uh, we can um, relinquish you from, okay. from Thank your, you. Thank you. from giving us some insight into the Board of Aldermen's budget. Uh, Alderwoman Schweitzer, did you have any further um, thoughts before we turn it over to other members of the committee to discuss? I, I really appreciate everyone sharing their thoughts and talking about my own. Yeah, everyone talking about their thoughts on this and you know the importance of becoming a more professional body. I agree completely uh, with that. Um, and streamlining services, uh, I think hopefully 
that as we move forward, the Board of Aldermen and Aldermen in general can, can focus more on, on policy and systems and everything that I think we are all here because we want to focus on those things and less on, you know, I think I've gotten three texts this morning already about dumpsters. <laughs> you know, I think, and, and I am responding to those texts and I am making sure my constituents know I am there for them and their dumpster. But I think that ideally we spend less time doing that and more time on legislation because we are streamlining departments, because we are trying to make sure that the other departments have what they need to do the work. Because when we talk about city services, we're really talking about other people doing this work. We, we talk about city services and we can guide people to city services and of course our board as serves is the legislative city service that we provide. Um, but I do want to, to make sure we're thinking about that when we talk about streamlining and, and a systems approach um, is, is how that changes going forward. Uh, I really appreciate everyone entertaining this. I know this is like a lot to, and to discuss and it's, it's, you know, I agree about holding up the mirror to our budget and thinking about, about what we need and what the needs are of the board um, and, and that the whole board should discuss this and they, and they will. Um, you know, in, at, on the floor. We will discuss this on, uh, as a full board. Um, and I, I really appreciate everyone sharing your thoughts and uh, entertaining my uh, suggestions today. Look forward to more conversation. You all know women's right rights right now. I mean, I think excellent points. We, you know, I think one thing we fail to recognize sometimes is that all of the constituent services, the dumpster requests are really an indication of a pretty broken system. The fact that our legislative body is dealing with dumpsters, um, you know, that just indicates to me that it's the privilege to have access to their elected official who's getting their dumpster replaced and everybody else who's sitting out there, CSB is not functioning at an optimal level and our dump, you know, and, and our trash department isn't operating at an optimal level. Clearly that's the case across the city. If you've driven down any alley or even any street in the city. And the legislative body should not be the service delivery system, period. When that is the case, it is, uh, it is automatically political. There are people that did not vote for me that do not feel comfortable reaching out to me about their dumpster. I am aware of that. I try to make it myself as accessible as possible, but the baseline reality is that there are many people that don't even know what an alderman is. And we shouldn't be the service delivery system. We are because our city, and it's not new, it, it is an ongoing issue that's been the case since as long as I've been down here that our, that, our, that our departments are not functioning optimally. And that is one of the reasons why I think we're really trying to dive into the budget and understand what, you know, where those holdups are and where those breakdowns in basic level of city services are. Um, Alderman, uh, Alderwoman Boyd, uh, we are going through each member's um, kind of thoughts, positions, uh, uh, pluses and minuses today, and um, we skipped you because we you uh, you were not here at the front end. So I'd like to, if you if you're ready to generally discuss your um, pluses and minuses on the budget, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, I don't have pluses and minuses because I had, uh, I've been dealing with this for quite a while and, and it's real clear that people have the impression all this money is here and we can move stuff around, but people need to look at the way the economy is going. We're going to be the way we were a couple of years ago. We're going to be scrambling for dollars, trying to keep our budget afloat because of the economy and the changes that are happening. And so I'd rather, you know, I did have conversation with some of the departments, but I brought up uh, a fair example. And so if you're cutting from one department and you're saying, well, we can cut from this department, and that department already was strapped, and then you're cutting them, and they were cut the year before. And so, to me, it's a hidden agenda there for that department, because that department is not the only department that has an excess of staff that hasn't been hired. So I think we need to look at why people do not want to work for the city of St. Louis. That's the issue. It's, it's not to the point because 
the, the building division haven't used all these slots and filled them, why don't they want to work for the building division? Why don't they want to work for the water department? So that's what I think we need to look at. And I'm just telling everybody, down the road, we're going to be in a crisis again because this is a one-time shot of the dollars that we have, and we will not have those dollars, and we'll be trying to figure out how to get revenue into our city to keep St. Louis City afloat. So I, I just have a problem when people get excited about cutting positions and taking people out because they don't, they don't have those, they haven't filled those positions. And I don't think anybody questioned HR to say, well, what can we do differently to attract people to our city, to want to work for our city? And so that's just where I'm at. I, I don't have anything right now. Thank you. Thank you, Alderwoman Boyd. Alderwoman Sonia. Um, you know, I, I agree with, um, with, with a lot of what Alderwoman Boyd just said. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there's a lot of reasons why people don't, you know, folks don't want to uh, work for the city. Um, and I, I mean, and I know that I, I believe a lot of that has to do with the fact that we need, you know, some more extensive policies to fix some of these systematic issues that we know have been plaguing us for a long time. You know, I'm not sure why it's been 13 years since we've adjusted our water rate. Um, and it, but, but I mean, but that's a sign to me, somebody in a department, in a system, something's missing because that's been missed consistently or ignored consistently and not, not raised. Um, so for me, just to get to the point for um, cuts and minuses, I'm glad we're having this day to discuss it and to talk about it. Um, in every public hearing that we had, the, the strongest ask all across the board from both public hearings, people kept referencing the public safety budget. People kept referencing, um, you know, particularly uh, what we spend on SWAT. Someone mentioned asset forfeiture and that the, the data analysis is not correct. So for me, um, either, you know, I guess because we were talking about the public earlier, to me, if we're looking at a budget and you're going to make cuts, if 51% of that budget is all allocated to public safety, you're a lot likely to going to need to do some reallocations from that. Um, I think we're in a tough position with that too, obviously, because our local control was just under attack by the state to take that away from us. And also because, you know, we do have a new police chief and I definitely want to see what, what he can do. Um, and I know he's made some changes already that I think are, you know, moving in the right direction, particularly with secondary employment for uh, police officers and encouraging them to spend more time with serving on the force. Um, so, for me, um, I'm either going to want to leave the budget, um, you know, as is, or if there's going to be allocations, I think we have to really talk about what holistic public safety looks like. And that means acknowledging the ties that public safety has with other departments, particularly public health. For me, of all the presentations I heard, that was the one, like, just to put this in analysis, we have a situation where, you know, um, uh, our she's like, I need a receptionist. That's like such a basic function to me. I don't know the best place for that money to come from. I don't know if it's best to just kind of see how, how things go because for me, I'm also curious if we've consistently had an understaffed police department not able to fill all the, all the positions, I would definitely want to pay close attention to where, what we're doing with their staff. And if they're continuing to be, you know, underspent, then it makes sense to me for us to come back and look at, at a committee and see how maybe some of that money could be reallocated. But I definitely want to, don't want to be remiss because, you know, there's one area that is that is coming before us and saying, no, we really don't need any new cars. And then there's another area that's coming before us and saying, we don't even, we don't even have a receptionist. And there's several other things she mentioned. And 
you know, I think often we will spend money on policing people and we will spend money on surveillance in people, but we will not spend money on investing people in public health and making health accessible is one of the ways that you can deal with addressing inequalities. It's one of the, of any, you know, so many of the things we're talking about in our society that even have to do with crime are a result of people not having access to the mental health and other services that they could use access to. And so if we're gonna start to have a conversation as a committee about what it looks like to really invest in people and get down to the roots of issues I think for me, I'm definitely interested in what it looks like for to fund those, especially some of those things to me that should be bare, bare minimum. You know, in many other cities, public health departments even have clinical services, which means that you don't just have to have private insurance to get access to health services. You can go to your public health department and get access to some of the, the earlier screenings and testings. Um, I just want to lift that up as a place for us to, to look at, and then I, I do... Um, want us to take a look at in in the budget I know what has been mentioned in public safety a lot is overtime I do think if we make changes to this public safety it should not be overtime because I hope that as our police chief gets a chance to work um, and gets a chance to kind of cut down on officers going outside for secondary employment, I think they'll be pulling from that fund. Um, what I think would be the place to look at would be the staffing and attrition budget, which right now is at um, a negative five million um, in our book because they anticipate that they will be, you know, um, understaffed and underfunded. So I'll just leave my. Can you help us under show? Uh the line item, yes. Where? I didn't mean to interrupt you, Alderwoman. No, 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 it's okay. Um, we can go, I just gotta get the page number. Pages in these books. Um, 353 is in, in the line item. Line item. Okay. Oh, 355 actually, sorry. Oh, okay. So maybe I'm looking at, are you looking at 510110? Yes. Um, so it says attrition, staffing, adjustment. That's a, ne a negative five million? It's a negative five million, which because there are, they're anticipating that they will be, you know, continue to be understaffed. And so I'm saying for us as a, as a committee, as a board, that to me, if we're gonna look at any changes, rather than cutting from things, that need to be, you know, cutting from departments that are going into bare bones and are cutting into their but their basics. That would be the thing to look at. But I'm also, you know, uplifting the fact that we do have a new police chief who, you know, may benefit from having some time to, you know, I'm interested in seeing the changes he makes. How does that do with attraction and retention as far as our officers go? He hasn't been there very long. And also, I also know the challenges that we had, um, you know, at the state with being under local control. But, you know, to me that this, this, should, this is a place that, that makes sense. Just even the fact that we do have a department that has so much funding that they, can't, they do have negative line items in their budget while other people are you know, asking for the basics. Alderman, you're bringing up an, a, a really interesting and excellent point here. I, I don't understand. There's several negative line items with this. The salary changes to fund 110, a negative 20 million. Um, can our financial analyst do, do you have any perspective on what's going on with these line items and why there's so many negatives throughout the police budget? It just is a very odd. Do you, do you mind clarifying what's going on? Do you know what's going on here? So I'm Ryan Coleman, financial analyst for the Board of Aldermen. Um, it looks to me, the budget director may be able to be better able to speak to this, but I believe what's happening here is so you can see the amounts of all the police positions uh, in one spot. 
they're in here under under fund under the general fund, but then because some of them are funded with other funds, you show the movement of that portion of the salaries uh, going to the other funds. And to go any deeper than that, I okay. So this is just—it's not necessarily, and these are not necessarily negative twenty million, negative three, neg negative thirteen. There's just so many of them. These well, those are, are that just shows that that portion of of the salary is picked up by another fund. Okay, and so the negative five million on the attrition. That's, yeah, that's that's. Alderwoman Sonia was correct in in saying that that's a, that's an amount to account for vacant positions throughout the year across the different funds. Right. Such an odd way to p p present a budget. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I've spent time combing through all of our budget, following up with all of our departments. And like I said, I know for a lot of people, this is such a controversial topic, but I just heard everyone before us talk about the public and what people want. And this was the area that everybody, so majority of the people who came to our public hearing said, please look at public safety, please look at reallocation. And then here's a line item right in our public safety budget where they're saying, hey, this is where we expect to be, you know, where we expect to underspend because we know how hard it is to attract and retain officers. So again, if we're going to be moving money around and doing reallocations, why would we go into areas that really need everything they have? And you know, again, it's so typical that it, 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 we have departments that, again, it's controversial, so people don't want to trust it, but if we're doing an honest financial analysis and we're being honest about numbers, if they are telling us that we expect to be understaffed and we are saying other air, we recognize the drastic need in other areas. This needs to be something that I would strongly encourage that we, you know, we take a look at. Thank you, Alderwoman. Um, I'd like to turn it over as I did for, and I'm sorry, I didn't do that for you, Alderwoman. You didn't have any specifics. No. But I'd like Madam to turn Chair, it over to, excuse. yes, thank you. thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate you jumping in, especially considering how new you are to this role. You're clearly very valuable to the board. Um, to the committee for Questions or comments to Alderwoman Sonia, Alderwoman Boyd. And so uh, I understand that what you all are saying in regards to this piece, but this is on paper. So when I go to a roll call and I told Alderman Aldrich this last night, and it's only 12 officers there, and I have 16 cars in maintenance so I don't have enough cars for people to patrol the community. So I have to look at the patrol officers. I don't have the patrol officers. And I've said this for over five years. The white shirts need to come out and they need to come on the ground. So I'm very transparent about that. My thing is Public safety is just not the police department. Absolutely. The police department, the, the fire department, they have positions that haven't been filled. Building division have positions they haven't been filled. And Alderman Aldridge, he started naming departments under public safety. So my frustration is last year, Chief John Hayden cut their budget of positions that weren't filled. So and contrary to you all, because you're young and you don't understand it, I'm an old lady. So I, I have the mindset, when you keep cutting something, eventually you don't have nothing. So right now, in the 13th Ward, we don't have police protection. We don't have enough officers because we did roll call three days in a community and we had to combine 5th and 6th District to make it look like we had some police. The residents, just like you say, the people told you to cut the police, the residents went out to the police and said, we need you. We need you out here on these streets. So what do you tell the people when you, they say, we need you, we need policemen on the streets? So what do you tell them? No, we need to cut them. No, we need to look at why is it people don't want to be the police. When you have officers that have given 20, 21, 22 years, apparently they believe in what they doing. But when they feel like nobody has confidence in them and feel everybody is after them, 
they give up. And that's what we dealing with. We keep on picking from that pot. So where are the other pots that people have in field positions? Have we looked at those pots? Have we looked at those budgets? Since you all have detailed and read these budgets, have you looked at the fire department's budget? Have you looked at the building inspectors, the building division budget? Have you looked at the all the departments that's under public safety and seen how long they haven't filled those positions? Because we got positions all across the city that have not been filled. And I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement, the health department, they need a receptionist. That's a really little bitty thing that we could do, we could do. But STL TV needs money too because they have a budget and they're supposed to get a raise, but when you increase the insurance, they're not getting a raise. They're coming on the short end, so they have to cut somewhere else to survive. So is it fair to them and they're constantly insuring that we are broadcasting, being out here for the public to see us. That's all I'm asking. I'm, I'm in agreement. Yeah, we probably do need to look at things differently. But I'm sorry. I'm just not a point blank defund the police. I, I'm, I'm just not for that because it's other departments that are suffering the same way. And maybe we need to look at some of the dollars they have. But just like the reporter asked me, how did I feel about the police work in secondary? I said, I'm embarrassed because I'm the employer of the police. That's a safety issue to me. So when they put that uniform on, I want them to come home. But if they gotta work a secondary, that's putting them under a threatening position because their reflexes on the shore. So that's what I keep saying. You gotta look at things holistically and not just saying one thing and this is what we doing. Um, so if you in a community where you got 80 year old women that's sleeping on the floor because bullets coming through their house, that's scary to me. Mm -hmm. And you only got 12 police on shift when you supposed to have 40. So that's scary to me. So I'm speaking from the community that I serve mm -hmm. And I'm very aware of how my community before me, before I got in office, was totally in the dark. And I have always pushed myself to educate my community on all issues that's out here. So all I'm asking is, if you're going to look, look all the way across the board. Did I not ask you that, Alderman Aldrich? Are you inquiring of me? Yes. Yes, you asked me that, but I think if I could respond, and I know you, you passionate. Well, she, she inquired. I know you passionate because not just your community. I know your relationship to a, a high-ranking police officer, but yes, you did. But I think it, it's 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 like what Alderman and Sonia said. Uh, this is the largest um, portion of our budget. Portion of our budget is not saying that we are trying to pick at them. We're not trying to defund. I think what we're trying to do is reallocate. We just try to defund the Board of Aldermen. But what we're trying to do is reallocate funds because gunfire that comes through that 80-year-old window house, if a police is on duty or a police is not on duty, that's not going to stop that young man who may be young and don't know anything, but I, who may be young. Um, police interactions, as, as, uh, as, as you you know all the women boy between the black community has not been well so is how do we reimagine the funds that are not being used i mean this is not no small amount of funds you talk about other departments that's not filling yes but not to the level where the police department even the the chief staffing saying yes we know we're not going to fill these funds how do we reimagine putting those funds in other areas so it actually can help our neighborhood. You talk about lighting earlier. You talk about, or during this process, how do we actually invest in public safety and not always look at that it is police? Because last time I checked, like you said, in the public safety division, it is more than just police. It is the building division. It is the health department, which I commend this young older woman for looking at, um, because health and mental health, especially in the black community, 
continues to be a problem, but we're not investing services in that. We're not investing services in these vacant buildings. We're not investing services. Each year the police budget is getting higher and higher and higher, but we're not staffing them up compared to the other budgets that may have vacancies, but the rate of income is not going up to the level of where the police department already know that they can't fill it. There's not even enough people in the academies that's going. We talk about people are not entering this field. It's not just entering the field in St. Louis. This is a national trend that people are saying they don't want to be police. That's nothing that we can do in this moment. That's going to be a culture change. That's like changing the culture of our community. And I think Rhea investing in areas in, a, in the city of St. Louis where 54 percent of our budget is public safety and majority of that is policing. And we doing the same things but not getting, a, and getting the same results is insanity. We are continuing to invest highly in public safety. We continue to invest a lot in police. Even when we had a, a large amount of police in the city of St. Louis, we still had high crime. At one point, at what point do we do something different and actually try to get different results? Yeah, I, I just to respond to Alderman Boy. You know, I totally respect you know and I've told you off the record that you have been straightforward you've been very honest in this process you've said the things but I never said and what I said I did not say defund the police it's not what I said what I said is the police department like every other department that has come before us the public safety department has submitted to a budget to us and in that budget they have identified this is not me I didn't do this they identified that they expect to be understaffed and to not spend this amount of money this is not if, if the Department of Health or any other department submitted a negative line item I would say it to them so you know young or not I have taken the time and I have combed through I, I really have I've invested hours I've, I've talked to so many folks who are of support to to us to make sure that this is on the money because this wasn't just aimed at at police but again what I'm saying is our public safety what I'm saying is there is some truth to what people are saying when they're coming in front of us and they're testifying and they're saying hey you put in so much money into this what about these other things that can help and again public health is public safety so so I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to get us to be, not only am I trying to get us to be holistic, I'm getting us to be realistic. It, it, it says something that this is the area of, in our budget that is, has, whether we want to say excess, they have enough, enough capital to have negative item items in their budget. What, like you mentioned, over the course of time, whether we're talking about the towing for the vehicles, whether we're talking about pothole services, whether we're talking about lighting services, whether we're talking about STL TV, whether we're talking about the Department of Health, these other departments do not have enough excess capital to have negative item items in their budget. We can't just have a loyalty to something because it's just because of its name. Like again, this is the budget that they submitted to us. I didn't have anything to do with this process. They gave this budget to us and they said, we expect to be underfunded by, I mean, we expect to be underspent by this amount. And it's not hard to imagine because if you're, if you're understaffed, any entity, what I know is if you're understaffed, you're going to spend less on staff and attrition and more on overtime because your folks are going to have to pick up overtime, but your salary money is being underspent because you don't have those positions filled. So again, this is not just about, this, this has nothing to do, some of the things that you named, I didn't say that at all in what I said. What I said is, here's a budget, here's what I've identified as money that they said was access and hey the public has come before us and they've lifted up these points and I'm also pushing for us to really be holistic at how we look at public safety what I do know is Dr. Mahdi the, the public of, Department of Public Health has had one of the fastest fastest rate, fastest rates of hiring folks and getting people in those positions she said that that's been factually true versus here's another area that is tied to public safety as well that's saying we're having trouble with retention that's not because I don't I'm not saying that that's what I want that I don't I want us to be understaffed that I want us to not have officers, but that's the reality of where we are. So why would we as a budget committee and a legislative professional body, why would we keep you know, keep putting money into something that we can't get funded. And I even said, hey, I get it. We are making a lot of changes as a city. We have, you know, a new police chief. We have some things in place. Perhaps those things need some time to work and see what happens. But the reality is this is understaffed. This is access money. And we have so many other areas that are in need. And I have put hours and hours into making sure that what I'm highlighting and bringing before you all is true. Uh, I lost my place. Alderwoman Sonier has the floor on her. On, and Alderwoman Boyd. Asking and questions. Alderwoman Boyd is asking questions and comments. Alderwoman Boyd, did you have further discussion? Yes, I do. Okay. So Alderman Aldrich, whoever I know in the police has nothing to do with this. 
I was doing this before whoever was on the police department was on the police. So it don't have nothing to do with this. All I'm asking is, and I understand what all the woman Sonia is saying. All I'm asking is, give North Patrol what they need in that district. I'm not asking for nothing extra for what's due to them. When you go to a roll call of the largest district, the highest crime, the highest murder rate, and only have 12 officers, what outcomes do you think is going to happen? And so that's what I'm asking for. Maybe that's a piece that you could look at, but also, again, we need to look at re-envisioning police safety, as we saying, public safety. Then we need to look at what do we need to be doing to attract people to come work for us? And, and I told you yesterday, I don't care about the white pages. I don't care about interns, research. I don't care about that because I'm living and breathing this every day. When I get a call of 15 guys with assault rifles standing on the corner, that's real. It ain't no white pages. It ain't no study. That's real life that's happening in our community. I have the highest crime neighborhoods in this city. And so all I'm asking for is give us what we need so we can look like Central West End, downtown, some part of South St. Louis. That's all we want. We just want what's due. And so I don't think them saying they're giving them a raise is going to stop these guys from working secondary because they have families that they have to take care of. So we're telling them, you don't need to take care of your family, and you need to just work for the police, and then you need, need to make do. Well, they want more than that. And so I just don't think it's fair for us as a community. The North Corridor, again, continuously to lose out. Downtown has secondary. They have the marshals, and they have the police. We only have 12, and that's scary to me. So I want people in my community to walk their dogs in the morning. I want people in my community to sit on their porch in the morning. So if you reimagine it, I advise you to reimagine how you're going to build up the North Quarter and make sure that that area is as protected as the other area. And that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, I would also just lift up that the, I believe SLMPD is, um, you know, paying double in overtime and trying to, you know, I, I think they're encouraging officers to work, to stay with first employment, but also not disincentivizing them. They're just trying to make it a first option for employment. And honestly, um, you know, I represent the seventh ward. I'm very proud to do that, but I've lived all over our city. And when I go to communities that are operating the best, they're not operating the best because they're full of police. They're operating the best because they're full of resources, because they're full of businesses, before, because they're full of development, because they're full of, of, of many options. It's not police. That's not the thing that makes communities thrive and makes community booms. It may be they are public safety officials and they respond to things, but if you're talking about about looking at making communities missing in, in areas that have been historically, you know, disinvested in, which is total true. It's not just police officers. Like, that's not the thing that is going to address that. It is some, some other things. And I do believe, like you mentioned, being able to have a, 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 a mobile mental health service that is going to areas that we know don't have access to those services, being able to get our city services equally and equitably distributed to areas that are not there. Like, I think that is a part of the conversation as well, as far as getting all of our communities communities to a place where they are all thriving. And I would say that part of the problem might be historically that we do just kind of look at police as the entity that's going to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And it has to be a plethora of, of, of multiple professionals and of, of, of multiple resources. I've never been in a community like, oh, I'm so safe because all the police. Usually, like, the safest communities are the most resource communities. That's just what it usually is, and that's to no discredit because I work regular with the police captain and that police captains in the seventh ward, and I see how hard they work and what they do, and I respect their service so much. But I just think, in general, as a, as a city and as a society, we really do have to just look at things more, you know, more holistically. And again, all of that aside, I really just was looking at numbers and looking at where is the access and where is the meat, and this 
it's a negative line item. And so my thing is this, it's not about just police. And so North Patrol wasn't just police, they were community, one. Two, when you are trying to get development into your community and the first thing the developer says, your community has to be safe. That's scary to me because people are saying, I don't want to come in that community because I don't see how it's safe. So that's where the, the police are not policing, but they are being the community. And so, so many times people from other districts will say, how do you have those type of relationships with your police? I said, because it's more than them just policing. It's them outreaching. It's them bringing programs to the community so they'll know what's there for them. So that's where it is. For so long, it was intentionally not giving us the information and the thing. We have a federal clinic sitting in our community, and half the people don't even know what they do. So it's just about people not having the right information and not being able to do it. But the police should be a partnership. It shouldn't just be about them patrolling and walking the streets. It should be about a partnership in the community. And I'm, I'm through, because I'm not going keep going Before we go on to Alderman Aldridge, I noticed that the budget director came in. Um, Paul, well, would you? Also, we got to go to uh, Alderwoman Ann Spicer. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes. But could we just clarify this negative, these negative line items? I know Ryan did a great job, but I, um, uh, if you could help us understand. It's very confusing, and I, and I have to give um, Alderwoman Sonia credit for d diving into this. We didn't, I didn't notice this earlier, these negative line items, but it's really alarming, and it seems yeah. strange. <laughs> Well, okay. Let, let me, What's going on? Yeah, let me give you some background. And I, and I was thinking as, as you go through this, and, and as some of you knew, some of you not, I actually prepared some information for you. And I'm going to talk, talk in, in general about all departments, then we'll talk specifically about the police department. But I, because uh, you were, I, some of the questions in previous, and, and I know we, I've gotten questions about how much the department's spending, what happens when they don't spend all their salary amounts and such. So what I, what I did, um, if I can, I can share. Sure, yes. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Jay. In, in any given fiscal year, uh, department, let's say your department, you got 100 positions. In a normal year, you, let's say you would have 10 vacancies. So from a budget perspective, what do you do? And you say, oh, well, we know we want to budget, we want to fill those positions, but in reality, some of them are going to be vacant during the year, normal attrition, right? And, that, and historically, that's been the case. So we'll have something called salary savings, and you'll see it's scheduled, scattered throughout departments in the personnel schedule. Salary savings, negative dollar amount. So it may be 5% of the total, whatever it is, uh, and given. Now, and historically, that's what's happened. Uh, but in recent, since post-pandemic, and this is true for most departments, and it's unusual in, in that, unlike in the past where we were always struggling over the finding stuff for the budget, in the most recent years, it really hasn't been much of a budget problem for departments. It's the problem is filling the positions. Right. And from a budget perspective, then the question becomes, well, how long do you keep the positions funded and if, they, if they're not gonna be filled? And, and so, because uh, ideally you wanna fill the positions, but so do you just take, keep taking more salary savings and, and in, in reality, then you're not providing the funds to fill the positions anymore, or, or do you, are you actually cutting the positions out? Now, you don't want the budget to get too far out of whack in that you've got 100, budge, 100 positions budgeted in the, in the personnel schedule, but funding for only 50. So what is, what is the real budget then at that, case, at that point? I don't think we're there, but there are certain questions you've got to ask about departments over time uh, in, in terms of what's, what's the... The, the right amount. Now, what I've distributed to you is a, basically the illustration of our budgeted salary savings. So, uh, and there, are, not everyone, not every department has it. It's usually the bigger ones, and you can see the big differences. I'll point out the Board of Aldermen in particular because it's the first one there. Uh, in doing this year's budget, uh, FY23's budget, we had, the, the, you had the additional positions added, but it was saying, hey, they're not going to be there a full year, so there was a $544,000 in salary savings there. 
In the FY24, you've only got $50,000 in salary savings. That might be light, actually, but, 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 that, but the idea was that you would be hiring more the fiscal year at that point in time. And you can go through the, the various departments that have salary savings there and, and, and such. Um, now, with regard to the police department, and, and uh, you're talking about all the, the negative adjustments. The police department has a number of funding sources, different funds. The general fund being the largest, but also has use tax fund, uh, um, some of the public safety, it has two public safety sales tax funds. And so what happens there, and it, let me use Prop P for, an, exa for an, uh, an example. Prop P was the sales tax that was passed a number of years ago to give $6,000 increases for police officers and firefighters, and it was for other things as well. But from, a, from a, the budget standpoint, you're paying for that raise in the special fund over here, but your general fund personnel schedule is here. So how do you illustrate that the funding for the police department and then show that you're funding, you're using the, the sales tax for raises? Well, you're not going to put, well, this officer is half funded here and half funded here. Well, we, didn't, we thought that would be more confusing. So we put the full salaries in the general fund. And then we put a negative adjustment down below saying this is being charged to Prop P. Okay, so that's why in the various, and if I get to the right page, that's why you have those negative adjustments. That's not a cut in the budget. What it's doing is saying this portion of the salaries is being funded by this special fund. So um, let me get to the TO here. Does seem very well. Actually, it's when you think about it, what's the alternative. The alternative is that you create a personnel schedule with a portion of a salary here and a portion of a salary over in another special fund, which is would be right. confusing. Yeah. So what you've got. So for instance, when you look at the negative negative amounts, um, uh, the charges to fund 1121. That's the jeez. Uh, they changed the fund numbers on me. And I can't, I can't get to draw a blank here. Uh, the, I believe that's the prop P, prop P money, so that's being charged over to, the, to that particular fund. So all of these, uh, and same thing with the uh, Fund 1119, which is a special fund, Fund 1116, that's the Graduated Business License Fund, which, it, which was passed, I think, in 2008 for enhanced police services. Well, that's paying for salaries, but it's, it's just another source. So, and if you, look at, if you look at those budgets, that's what you're seeing. So that, the only real reduction in salary you see from those negative dollar amounts is the one that you addressed earlier, which is, which is the salary attrition reduction, okay? That's the minus five million, because the, the department's saying, oh, we don't expect to have be filled, we'll heck expect to have attrition and, and all of that. Now, um, I, I do know, we try to take this into account when we do the budgets. Uh, the police department overall was underspent if you exclude marshals and rangers, because they were underspent too, but the proper was 1.2. The other part was uh, marshals and rangers. We we increased the salary savings by a million four. Now is that? I mean, that seems reasonable, but is that is that an exact number? You you really don't know. I mean, you just try to make a reasonable estimate. Every everything in the budget is a regional is an estimate based on what you believe it to be rational, and reasonable. So, but that's basically the thinking goes behind some of the negative adjustments and when where we end up uh, uh, budgeting thank you paul so uh, it's coming from different pots right yeah yeah those ones that have special funds that's not a cut that's just saying this this we passed prop p sales tax to pay those salary increases we did back in whatever year it was mm -hmm. and that that fund is picking up that tab that's why while we've got all the salaries listed in 1010, you've got a That's negative like adjustment. Negative. That portion's being picked up by that fund. Okay. Okay, and uh, the, when we cut, when Chief Hayden made those cuts, was that from the same sort of, I mean, we, we maybe two years ago, I think there was a cut to the police budget that eliminated positions that weren't filled. Am I correct in that? That's correct. Okay, and then was that kind of in the same vein? No, that was actually an actual reduction. Right, right. That was not a, right. another fund. That was That's just a, 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 a reduction in general fund. Okay, all right, thank you, Paul. Do you have any questions for the budget director on this? Oh, sure, Alderwoman Schweitzer. Thank you so much. So this negative uh, five million in this budget represents money that's coming from another fund or it represents salaries that they do not expect to pay? 
That's, that's a salary reduction that they do not expect to be spending, How which many? is why, it, why, it's, why it's a negative number. It's been pulled out of their salary total. Right. right. How many positions is that? Yeah, I, um, I did a little bit of an analysis, and I don't know that this is an exact number, um, but if the rate of pay for officers is about 60800 um, then this is anticipating a little bit over um, 80 less officers than, it, than we have for fully staffed capacity. Um, 83 to be exact, but I'm, I'm saying a little bit over, over 80. I appreciate that answer, because um, I know we're... The police department is short 154. Right. So it's saying that the they expect they to pick up some. Yeah, I, I, they're expecting to hire around 70, but not not the full amount. And so if that's if that's is that patrolmen? Because be real clear, it's patrolmen. That's what I'm looking at. That's an is interesting question patrolmen? too, because that'd be a different calculation. Right. Because that's the issue I'm having. It's the patrol. <laughs> Isn't that a, just for clarity, wouldn't that be outside of just pay? Isn't that like an organizational structure for? Oh, yeah. That's not, that's not what we're doing here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So, but the number is what we're trying to figure out. Right. I mean, I so think that's. that 83 patrolmen? I, I don't, I, I really think that basically, I, I don't, I think that they expect to pick up 70 more officers and it's going to depend on the duties in which they give officers I don't I couldn't get the information because they don't even know exactly who might fill the positions exactly what their qualifications would be but I did ask specifically only about police officers so this number doesn't have to do with like sergeant at arms or people who sit at desks this is about police officers but when I started to inquire about you know specific duties and things like that it was harder to get answers because they weren't exactly sure but they were just basically like listen this is what we can tell you from a you know a numerical budget wise standpoint um, but it's officers. Uh, it's officers. It's officers. Um, Alderwoman Schweitzer. Yeah, uh, I, appreci I appreciate the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I don't think I have any further questions. Well, actually, I know that one of the things we'd asked for, maybe it was, it was given out, but was the third quarter report. Do we have that in this? The job? director did send that to me. I apologize. I did not yeah, I uh, think distribute that. That's fair. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving parts. Um, the, uh, what I am asking about now for those watching at home is, you know, when the city does these budgets, one of the things that helps make the decisions is the quarterly reports of how much the departments have spent. Please correct me if I ever misrepresent your job or what you're doing. But the third quarter report is now available so we can see what departments have spent and what they had budgeted last year, what they've spent so far, and then it'll allow us to see more of how those numbers work for last year's budget and how they might reflect upon this year's budget. Is that accurate? Well, yeah, I, and again, I, I do want to highlight the fact that, I, I, again, every year you're going to have some underspending within a given department. But the, but, the, but, but the unique situation you've seen in the last couple of years is that the difficulty in hiring more. So instead of a 10% vacancy, now you're having three, 30%. And from a budget perspective, you're going to say, well, we don't want to cut 30% of the positions because right. we really want to fill them. Um, so from a, do you take those funds? I mean, it, well, it, that's what it's It's allowed. a reasonable, but you're trying to come right. at that happy medium there. I understand. I, I think I understand. Um, the uh, interesting part about all of this is, as we know, as you've so told us multiple times, is how when the funds that aren't spent come back to, to be reallocated, half is going to general fund, half is going to capital improvements. So the reason that we've been able to make have raises for employees is because we haven't filled all those spots because that has been the biggest salary, the biggest savings the city has had largely is not having staffed positions. So it's definitely a how do you balance giving people more raises knowing that the reason that people have been able to get raises largely is because the positions haven't been filled and that half of the money that's coming back goes to the people who are currently working here. Retention incentives, I agree. That is a very interesting dilemma to be in when you're in a situation where you're trying to figure out, you know, the city is chugging along. There's, you know, things that aren't working well, things that are working really well. I think a lot of conversations have been had about all those things, but, you know, you're right in terms of how many folks do you, when you're looking for funds, a lot of it's going to be cutting staffing and to, in order to have it to be a dedicated line item. And with the way that the money comes back, um, you know, it's not like 
the 100% of the money that comes back, 50% of it goes to capital, and 50% goes to, you know, 10% health department, 10% human services, you know, that's not what's happening with the money. So, um, yeah, the departments keep asking for this. I, I have, Do I have my own. see where I'm going with that? I appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, when a department says, oh, well, we should be able to spend all our money and at the end and for our department. I, I, I do have an issues with that. Uh, sure. Simply because, as, and I'm glad you pointed that out, we, the, we have a very good policy of what happens with surplus funds. I, I mean, half of it goes to the fund reserve, which is why we've gotten our reserves back to where we are. And the other half goes to capital. Hmm. And, and why is that important? One, it gives you a source of addressing your capital needs. But two, you don't know whether that's going to be a recurring thing. Right. So mm -hmm. let's say we do get to the point where we're hiring and we got more people. Well, uh, if, if, you, if all you're doing is putting it back into increasing uh, TOs, that's, that's a permanent cost. Whereas capital is a, you, gotta, you buy a piece of equipment, you get that done, and you, you, know, have, you don't have an ongoing obligation. We so, should, though, because we need to maintain things better. Well, you know, on a maintenance level. Right. But, but you're talking about, in terms of you know, big capital items and such, which have 20 or 30 year lifespans, you can hopefully address those things with some of the money, as, as we have in the last, with the last, like the 24 million right. appropriation we did this year. So I, I think that's a good policy of what happens with funds that aren't spent or, or, or are surplus prop uh, each year. And hopefully we have one this year, and we'll have another supplemental capital appropriation this year. Um, yeah, and, and I'll also add that that's a very public process as well. As you know, as you all have members of the, have been participants and, and members of the, the Citizen Advisory Committee as well as the Capital Committee, uh, as opposed to a, a director who might say, oh, well, I want to just transfer money to here and spend it on whatever. Uh, so I, I think that's, those are, that's a good policy to maintain, and, and, we've been, and we've been fortunate to be in that position the last few years. That right. wasn't the case. Yeah, so the decisions that we're making now impact what that looks like at the end of next year with how much money will come back, which is, you know, you're, gonna, it, you're, you're not necessarily thinking about that right now. It's like, okay, well, how much money are we going to expect to come back so that we can use it for capital thing? You know, what's going to happen in this, in this way? So, right. um, you know, I, I'd be interested in knowing the breakdown of that $505 million. Um, you know, I agree that we have some really pressing this year public safety things that need to be spent on that aren't necessarily in the um, public safety department, but I also think that, you know, we need to hire more officers. Uh, and so um, in, in this the discussion, I, um, I think that we should probably go in like a recognized order just to keep um, kind of moving along. But um, I, uh, I am interested in that in terms of, you know, where, if, if the board were to consider that, what would be what was funded? I mean, some of the things that I think that, that I brought up that I'm interested in are, you know, the sewer lateral program, the tree, uh, trees getting cut. Um, you know, I think I found, I hopefully found something for the health department to have their receptionist if we don't have a sergeant at arms, the board. Um, so I do think that, you know, these conversations do need to be having context for what happens to this money um, and not, and, and how does it address public safety? Um, because I do think that, you know, that's what it's earmarked for. It should be addressing public safety. And, you know, I'm the, I, I, I agree that there's so many things that keep us safe. One of those things are our police officers. Other things involve other departments and other, other operations of, of city government. So, um, you know, I, I think this has been a really interesting discussion so far. And uh, I think all of my, I think I have a few, I have questions about what that 5 million really looks like. What is the breakdown of that? you know, just details, that's a lot of money. I mean, that's more, that's, that's almost our whole Board of Alderman budget, and we have a line for every single bit of that money, you know, so uh, I'd be interested in, in that. Um, but I appreciate the, the conversation and, and talking about this issue. Uh, thank you, Alderwoman uh, Schweitzer. Alderwoman Sonia. I just wanted to know um, from you, Mr. Payne, I was kind of running some numbers myself, but do you have a number of last year what our surplus was from unfilled positions? Do you? From? from unfilled positions. If, I, if my math is right from looking through, it was well over 40 million, um, but No, you... it, the, the surplus was 48 million. Okay. The, I, I could actually, on, on the website, I've got the fiscal year end <laughs> report. Right. I don't have it in the top of my head because it's been almost a year, but uh, a little over half of that was revenue, on the revenue side. So remember, there's the revenues and expenditures, and I think 
uh, I, I don't want to give you a number off the top of my head. No, that's okay. But it, but it's in the uh, the and it's posted online what the revenue what the end of year fiscal report was. But it was a forty eight million dollars surplus last year. Again, that's why we had the twenty four for capital. But uh, the majority of that, and, and I, I, a large amount was that was under and, and expenditures, but a, a, the, the, a greater than half of that was in the revenue side as opposed to the expenditure side. Yeah. And so on the, uh, the, on the expenditure side, not all of that would have been personnel, but I would imagine the most of it would have been personnel related. Okay. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just be, I'm sure all of us would be curious, like, what that number is from just unfilled positions in general. And, and, uh, and actually the report that, actually, Paul, that Paul sent last night, which I just forwarded to the committee, has this last year's um, revised quarter three um, of those unfilled, uh, unfilled uh, excuse me, unspent. Or, or excuse me, it, by department, what has been spent thus far through quarter three. So it's kind of helpful in understanding what departments are spending for this year as a, you know, as a good benchmark for where we are right now. And I could also get you that number specifically for personal services. Okay. Right. Um, Alderman Aldrich. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for getting that so quickly uh, to all the members as we're working and asking questions at the same time. I would, you know, echo um, what Alderman and Sonia said. If you can get that, that numbers uh, also of how much did we, how much did we save by not filling the positions last year? How many officers we had last year? Are we up officers now? Are we down officers now? I, I mean, I have the numbers. I do have what you had in your second quarter report. I do have that information, but um, it just, it, it was from second quarter, so it, it, it's pretty outdated, so that's why I didn't mention it today, but I did read through your reports thoroughly, and it helped me put some of this together. Thank you for, <laughs> that's, a lot of effort goes into those reports, that's great. <laughs> and then also, yeah, that um, I would love to talk with you off uh, record to learn more about that, that 40 million surplus sure. between the revenue and, I mean, because that just yeah, sounds like a... Yeah, I, I would highly recommend just re, uh, as a, pr a preface to that, uh, reading the year-end report that I sent to the Board of ENA, and it's posted on the website. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, just for uh, further clarity, Paul, um, if we've got a negative five million accounted for, uh, does... Can, is that already is that five million already removed from their budget? Yeah, the way the personnel schedules work is, and you'll see this, the the bottom line number on on the on the total. So, for instance, the uh, that thirty three, that thirty three three oh one, which is, this is on page three fifty five, and if you see where I'm going, it says total all positions thirty. Yeah, <laughs> it's getting to that point now, I know. Um, the the 3830101012, right? You follow me? No. Oh, okay. 30 what? The, the thir 30. On page 355. Oh, yes, okay, all right, all grades total, five, the 510, 1110. Right, now let me, let me go back to that. Sure. Okay, 38. Trace that back to. And then where? Uh, let me, I'm, I'm going there, let me get that. If you go to page three, okay, that's the, 324. The, I'm looking at 355 where we were originally looking at the negative five million. No, here, I'm, I'm trying to get you there. Okay, so <laughs> the, the summary total for the, the uniform salaries on page 355. See that 38301012? Yes. You follow me? Yes. Where I'm at? Yes. Okay, now you go to page 324. This is intuitive. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> we can talk about fund simplification anytime you like. I, I can, I'm all I gotcha. for it. 355, 324, yes, we are here. You look at the second line item there. Okay, yes. 3830, that's the same number. Okay, so, so we. Which, which means it incorporates the negative five. So, in other words, can we take out the five million? No, the five has been taken out. Okay. All right. That's where you got that number. Okay. So it's already been removed from the yes. budget. Okay. All right. Thank you, Paul. So, all right. I am going to take a very quick break because I drank all this water and a big cup of coffee and hand it over to my vice chair uh, because where we are in the process, Alderwoman Sonia has presented her uh, ads and minuses and we were going through the committee for that. But Alderwoman Sonia, now that we've kind of, now that 
uh, we've, I, that it sounds like the negative five million has already been removed from the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, did you want to? No, I mean, um, I've already had conversations, so I was aware, but that, like he said, that money is, is what they anticipate to fill. It's what they, it's, it's what they think that won't be filled. Like this is the officers we won't have, but we don't have any numbers or any data and we only had the second quarter number. So I'm saying that if we were going to be moving things around since, and maybe there are other areas to look too, but that might be a place for us to look because it, I mean, in 2017, Prop P was passed to get us 150 more officers. We, we didn't. I mean, the money, that, that line item is reliant upon us actually filling it with, with officers and, and attracting them, which, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that we won't, but based off of how it's been moving, it doesn't look like we will. So I was just bringing that point up as, like, if we're looking for places to go and looking for places where there may be access, that is a, a potential place. Right. Um, I guess, but the clarification that Mr. Payne just offered was that that the net, that five million has already been subtracted from the budget, so it's already but been it's, removed. But he also said that that's based off of what they anticipate to attract. So, and I'm saying that's saying that they they're saying they think they're going to still get 70 more officers. So we, you know, I was saying as a committee, we should be watching to see will they, that still could be a number that's an underestimation. Is what I'm saying. Does that make sense? That's uh, okay. Thank you. For yeah, the all budget numbers are estimates right. at the yeah. time. But okay. my question is. So under public safety, where it has uh, four million. Vice Chair, excuse me. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to hand this over to you. Anyway, so. <laughs> where it says four million under public safety, where it has six one six one zero oh, six one one six one two. So has that already been pulled out? Yes, what this is, what that illustration is showing is showing the salary savings amount in the various departments. Okay. So public, well, police is a, is a separate item on that one. Public, you got public safety, which is director and fire and uh, building division, all, all et cetera. It's showing what the dollar amounts were in salary savings in the budget for FY23 versus the budget for FY24. And, right. and Public safety, excluding police, it was four million in FY23. It's 8.4 million in FY24, and the big increase there, you're going to see. Well, there's two increases. One is in fire, which went up to five from 2.5, and that that basically reflects that we budgeted more overtime. They had been overspending a lot of overtime because of the the uh, of their staffing issues, and and then so they said, well, we'll increase the salary savings and increase overtime. So th that's that's a pretty much where, where that is. And then on the Justice Center, they, they've been carrying a significant number of vacancies. That's another one of those departments where you we need to look at the staffing structure there. But th there's a, uh, a 3.1 million dollars in salary savings that that department. Okay. Does anybody else have anything else for Paul? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Thank you. Appreciate you so much. So, did anyone else have a uh, add or take away? I think it was on me to talk on uh, all the women Sonya's after Ann Twicer. So, who did what? He, everybody, we were going down the line. People were getting to ask me questions about what I was saying. It was okay. His turn. So, did you have anything on the? On the I keep it uh, short um, because I have uh, talked to many of you guys offline because I, I hate to. Uh, um, do things sneakily um, about kind of um, where I plan to take, which is very similar from all the women, uh, Sonye. Like she said, we've been working really hard, no matter new or not, we've been working really hard to try to identify spots and have worked with Paul, uh, Director Paul Payne. I uh, have worked really hard with our financialists uh, at the Board of Aldermen, uh, have spoke with uh, the chief, uh, chief of staff, just as of uh, yesterday to see um, if something like this was even doable, so it does not uh, hurt the police department. I think me and all the women Sonia share the fact that, you know, no matter where you live, people want to feel safe, and that's why I echo all the women uh, boy. You know, we do see a lot more policing in the downtown area compared to North St. Louis or even parts of South St. Louis. Um, but you know, going back to it, you know, I think by making investment. And what all the women so yay is doing a small amount i think it's what seven uh seven hundred some thousand a small amount um from uh potentially public safety uh knowing that we're not like the director just said knowing that we're not going to fill those staff positions to put it in health um 
is, in my opinion, a public safety matter and just really appreciate being able to work with you on this because I know how important, like you said, for the for our last community meetings, uh, for the ones who've been able to uh, be there and watch it online, the community, you know, that we, we knew that we had community meetings uh, on the books coming up and if we wanted to get uh, our community out, that was one way that we could have, you know, could have done it and folks at uh, both of the community meetings echoed over and over that we are hugely overspending in the police department. If it's the SWAT or if it's asset forfeiture, I got issues with shot spotters uh, that in my opinion is not an effective uh, tool. Um, it's, a, it's a sound mechanism, but you really don't be able to pinpoint the person. But the community has said over and over at these public meetings at the helm of Madam Chair that we need to really be looking at uh, the public safety budget, and I appreciate the other women uh, for doing that. And I'm going to keep it short because I'll be doing the same thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Okay, so, Alder. Everybody has. Everyone has commented on Alderwoman Sonier's suggestions. So uh, now we'll move on to Alderman Aldrich. Thank you. Uh, First, I want to uh, to set the set the tone. Uh, I really, this has been a uh, interesting process to learn about the city uh, budget coming from um, the the state house. I thought that the state budget was tricky, but it is even more tricky uh, with our city budget, especially the way that is laid out. And you know, Madam Chair, uh, I, I continue to give you a praise, but I want to be very clear for a new member uh, on this committee. Some of the folks I'm like, mm, we didn't have to really listen to, but I really do appreciate uh, um, your intentionality of really making sure that uh, we were able to uh, dive into the budget and maybe folks that I thought that we shouldn't have been listening to end up learning that actually that's just something we wanna keep an eye out on what they're doing with their budget. So I appreciate uh, you and I appreciate the members on this committee has, has been helpful, uh, and Paul and the staff and everybody. I think this has been a, uh, a a tough decision to try to figure out, especially as as we learn that the the buddy budget uh, is flat going into like the next year. How do we um, do things in a way where we we decrease, but we're not uh, hurting departments or hurting. Uh, uh, yeah, departments that need help. Uh, there's not probably one department that didn't come forward to us and say, I could use a little bit more money here, I could use a little bit more money there, I could use a little bit more money here. Um, and as I've been um, thinking about it, and, and I don't have an uh, amendment to offer, I, like most of us want to just have a conversation. Um, as I've been thinking about it, I think, you know, public safety just have so much, uh, with that being 50% of our budget, so much funds in that uh, account, especially when it comes to policing, uh, that we know that they're not going to use. I am a, a, a big supporter of you know what our mayor did, is giving the police probably the the highest raise that they've ever got in a long time. You know, her being a champion in in Jefferson City, uh, not just this year, but for the last several years of making sure that our police have local control, um, because it's the people in the city of St. Louis that need to have input on their police department. Um, and I'll, that's why I commend the people at the public safety, I mean, the public hearings that have been coming that's saying uh, how they want to see their police department because at the end of the day, they don't feel safe also uh, and believe that we can do things uh, differently with a budget. I think we also just gave like additional 20 million on top of raises. Uh, where I would like to see, um, I would like to see a decrease in public safety, uh, roughly around 300,000. Uh, I've talked with, uh, Frank at the building division, um, and I've talked with other departments, but I know as we were, what really triggered me to, to speak with uh, the commissioner is hearing how much uh, income that the building division actually brings in to the, to the city of St. Louis. And of course, all our departments are understaffed, but uh, in that time of, of talking with him, one thing that he really, um, uh, as I was asking him what he could use those funds for, he really uplifted was vacant buildings. Uh, we got roughly about 6,000 uh, vacant buildings throughout the city of St. Louis, some or LRA, some or private properties. But in a lot of these vacant buildings, uh, what if they had the support and staff, they would be able to um, 
go out and assess these vacant buildings, potentially find these vacant buildings and put these fines on the back end for them to pay it uh, at the end of the year for their, um, like their, their taxes. Um, just alone in a few wards that I will speak on, uh, just alone in the first ward, uh, which all the Schweitzer is, there's, they've been able to look at and see there's about 107 uh, vacant buildings if they were able to collect all those fees. Uh, on those, you're, you're talking roughly $96 million. Uh, in the Alderwoman 8th Ward, uh, Alderwoman uh, Spencer roughly got a total of about 147, uh, 129 a private, roughly they, if all those fees, if they had the staff to be able to put them on the tax roll, you're talking about 160 some million. Um, and, and that list goes on and on and on. I can share it with everybody, but um, I would love for our building division, which is in, under public safety, so it's it's not, um, taken away from public safety, but it's it's removing um, dollars into the building division um, to be able to support our staff, especially uh, hoping that those uh, inspectors can do those inspections, especially in in areas that have more vacancy than others, than in areas that's not downtown, areas that's not central West End, area that's no shade. I'm sorry, all the one like Carondelet Park, uh, you know, areas that are like, in, that we, we see what our mayor is saying that you wanna do invest in North St. Louis because it's been so disinvested. People are walking outside to these vacant buildings and, and having this mind frame of, you know, why feel hopeful? Why feel um, like I'm, I'm just existing in my, in my community. I'm not really uh, living in a place because the city has invested in it. So all that being said, I think uh, by investing in the building division, which is still under public safety so that they can really focus on parts of the city that haven't been focused on to be able to figure out with these vacant buildings what's going on with them, be able to find them and for us to be able to generate money, I think would be a good investment um, uh, for us and, and a good investment that we can make at the board that's not a lot of money but it would still be in the public safety department and I'll turn it over to the committee for questions uh, Alderwoman Boyd no Alderwoman Schweitzer thank you thank you so much um, I appreciate that. I do want to point out we do have a vacant building inside of Crondelet Park right now. So there are definitely vacant buildings around Crondelet Park uh, and, uh, you know, one facing the park, uh, another one just on, you know, I mean, vacant vacancy is, it affects every single neighborhood of the city of St. Louis, um, some more than others for sure, and some of the neighborhoods of Ward 1 more than others for sure. Uh, and it's something that I work on a lot, so I really appreciate you lifting that. Um, I feel like I'm stealing from Alderman Sanye there because I like the word lift up, like just bringing it to attention, bringing light to it. I think that's a great um, phrase that I hadn't used very often. And now I, I will really say it was you that really triggered me to look at the building division because you, you talk a lot about uh, the building division, even the, the lack of connection between the building division and the health department and stuff like that. But it was it was kind of you, Alderman. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I really do appreciate the building division information. Um, the vacancy piece is so, so important. And one of the things that, you know, you and I have talked about and I've, ta I, I've definitely talked about a lot is, you know, how much vacant buildings contribute to, a neg to sucking time out of so many different departments. Uh, I mentioned it in my comments when we first started talking um, in, in terms of how much each of us and all the departments spend on, on those things. And if we were able, if the city were able to effectively charge the vacant building fees as it should be doing, how much more revenue that would be for the city and for these very necessary um, services that are provided. Um, so that is something that I, I am definitely interested in seeing improve uh, in terms of, of making sure every vacant building in the city that's privately held is in that, in that getting that vacant building fee attached to it. That's a, that's a passion of mine. Um, I think that, uh, I, I guess I'm still, you know, the, the, I, where did you have a, um, a specific line that you were expecting to get the 300,000? Yes, it would be from uh, police salaries, uh, which would be one, or I mean, five one zero one one zero. So it would be basically from the, the salaries that we are aware of that won't be um, spent because, like our director said, we're not going to hire 170 something officers this year. So it would be out of salaries, moving it to. Doo -doo. 
out of salaries, moving it to uh, four inspectors in the building division with also including their um, FICA, their employment, I mean, their yeah, employment retirement plan, um, their health insurance or life insurance and all that tied into it. And so is that you're saying from the, is that coming from this negative $5 million? amount or are you looking at a different line item? I'm actually looking at the the salaries for police so this is the let me pull it up so we can be on the same page the salary adjust, yeah I wish yeah though it's not lined yeah it's right here million nine hundred ninety thousand yes okay because they're saying already that they accounted for five million dollars from their budget that has gone already back to other yeah. parts of the fund so you're wanting to pull? No, actually, I take that back. That No, this is actually coming from the um, page. It would be 324. Or no, it's actually, I take that back. It's the use tax. So I'm getting it all together. It's a use tax. Uh, I got to find that page. But that's the negative 5 million. It is uh, 19 in the use tax line. In the revenue book? Are you looking at the revenue book? I'm looking at the uh, line by line item. Okay. On page. There's the use tax. We have revenue pages which show the different taxes that come in where all those funds go um, or where how they're generated uh, and then the budget books show where all the money goes so I'm trying to figure out where you're seeing um, page 324 shows a fiscal year 24 request of 31 million ish from the for the salaries for police and then so it would be on page what I'm hearing is 339 okay we can go there Use tax. Yeah, I, I would need a, uh, I guess, a better understanding of, you know, as, as Paul Payne presented, the salary pages are already in, you know, the salaries in the budget, and then if there's money coming from another fund, that's shown in the budget as well. So you're saying that their request was 17 million from the use tax, and they're getting 19. So they requested. And you're trying to get it from from that that. Yes, they requested less than what we're actually giving them. Right, and that has to do with the raises. I'm not sure about that. I think the difference, I think a lot of departments have the budget request as slightly lower than what was proposed by the budget director because their request came in before the raises. Right. Their raises are just significantly more yeah. Yeah. than other departments. Um, yeah, I would, I think I, I'm, in order to consider this request, I would I, I might need to see some more um, documentation all on one page, uh, and where the request would be would be going. Um, I think, as as I said at the beginning of my comments, and over and over again, we need to be thinking more about how we get money into the city, right. and those vacant building fees are definitely, there's a lot of room for improvement and getting more fees right. collected. Your ward, my ward, every ward. Um, so that is a revenue stream that we should be pushing as hard as we can because of how damaging those properties are to our city and to our workload and to just every single department. I, I mean, there's very few departments that don't deal with that. So uh, I really appreciate you pinpointing that specific problem. Um, but I think I'd need to see a little bit more documentation. Uh, and I know, you know, we're trying to hear from the departments about that the suggestions, you know, the president's office spoke about some of my suggestions for cuts. So if we were going to do that, I would, I'd want to see, you know, what the, 
police department said about that and, and, and what their expectations are. I, I had thought this had met their expectations already for how much salary they weren't going to be spending and that that money had already been allocated to other parts of the budget. But I'm, I'm not sure if I'm not seeing the whole picture. And so I wanna make sure that I am as I make decisions. So I, I appreciate any anything that you could get me that would show all of this on sort of one page um, so that we really know what we're talking about. Uh, thank you. That's all for me. Okay, Alderwoman Sonier. Um, you know, I, I really don't, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you are advocating for the building division, I think. Uh, vacancy is a problem, of, you know, across St. Louis period, but absolutely on, you know, obviously, definitely um, on the north side of St. Louis is probably in much higher numbers. Um, and yeah, I agree that if this is a money, th this helps in multiple ways because it's a problem in all of our communities and it can help the city make money. And obviously there's some things in the air where some of our revenue streams may, may be impacted. So whatever, you know, if we can deal with both the community issue and help the city generate income and revenue then I think that's that's a, a good way to go and you know I think what you're saying is just like you know we could do what we do where money keeps going back into the fund at the end of the year when it's left over but then in that aspect we we've, we've missed a moment to impact people's lives right away like right now in this moment so I don't have any questions Alderman Aldridge <clears throat> Uh, real quickly on the vacancy piece, um, I just was looking through our, I know we allocated a significant amount to um, vacant buildings through ARPA. I think I was looking at the transparency portal. I think there's 13, 15, 13, 15 million at, uh, allocated to vacancy through ARPA that hasn't been spent yet. So that's one area I'm not really, I'm not exactly clear on where those funds are gonna be spent. Uh, specifically um, or why they haven't yet been spent but um, we do have some there I do share your interest one, one thing I didn't I failed to ask uh, Alderwoman Sonia um, was just whether or not I think you know in doing our due diligence like we were uh, asked about uh, the Board of Aldermen in communicating with the Board of Aldermen about what the cuts would look like if we had communicated with the, the newly appointed Commissioner Police Commissioner on um, what he anticipates being able to hire, not being able to hire, and what that would look like for the police department. And if there had been discussions with the commissioner about his department. I will, I will do like you did during, not trying to be funny, during your gun bill. I won't speak, but I will say there have been some communications with that office and uh, from the numbers uh, that we was able to generate um, from where the funds could be coming from, from their salaries does not feel like, again, that they will meet those expectations of, you know, fully uh, fulfill the police budget. I think all of us are wanting to, I mean, all of us want to support our new chief. I also want to support our new circuit attorney um, that come in and want to make sure that we're not doing anything as we talk about public safety and policing. That takes away from that manpower. And from what I was told that um, these funds coming from salary areas would not, uh, deeply impacted because they're just not going to fill it by the end of the year. Um, I think it might be helpful to get some them more, some concrete perspective as Alderwoman Schweitzer was kind of pointing out just to, as we did our due diligence with the Board of Aldermen um, and, and those potential cuts we could maybe consider that as well. Um, um, and if we could maybe look in, I think that um, your point on the vacancy and the vacant buildings is well taken. I do know that the building division um, cannot issue um, those those tax liens. Um, you know, those are those come through a coordinated approach through the city councilor's office and the collector of revenue, um, and those are initiated first by the collector of revenue's office, and then uh, the, the the legal aspect is handled through the city councilor's office. And in speaking with the new city councilor, she has um, increased that portion of her budget for vacancy and for filing those, you know, for nuisance and other issues of how, you know, the, uh, um, I would say, predatory uh, property ownership. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that that's, uh, those budget items have been allocated and that the city council is working on that. So there is some, uh, there is some work in that regard, which is going to be, I think, really helpful. Right. Um, 
because it is long overdue and very, very, very needed, and I think your points are well taken that um, that going after those derelict property owners um, is not only generates revenue but helps to stabilize and, and make our neighborhood safer. Um, sure, go ahead, Alderwoman Boyd. Uh, I do know, and I'm glad that we're speaking on this, I do know that the uh, administration is working closely with the city council because I've been in those conversations in regards to those drilling buildings, and they are uh, being becoming more aggressive, and financially they have the dollars because of the offer and stuff. So I know the administration, the, the city councilor, and the building are working as a team to address those issues. So uh, I don't think it's to the point they need just special inspectors to look at that. I think, again, conversations need to be had for the understanding of what the administration is trying to do because they're aware of the uh, issues because I've been real vocal about it. The issues with these, and I call them slum landlords. And so we have people that do not live in our city that have these properties. And so uh, I applaud them because now they're becoming more aggressive with it because they see the challenges that the communities are having, having to deal with that and the property values that are going down. So. That's why I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of like Auto Woman Swicer. I would rather have more information about it because I think that they have put a lot of money in, invested a lot of money into the building division. So they have put a lot of dollars toward demo, addressing the vacancy piece. So they have done that. So I just would like to see, let's get more information on it. That's all. And I could get that in like what Auto Woman uh, Spencer said, different from the ARPA funds that may be allocated, but where are, you know, are they being in use yet? So, but I can get those to you. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, well, I was just saying, so as we were uh, doing our due diligence on the Board of Aldermen, um, I just wanted to make sure we communicated with the police commissioner um, as we consider cutting his budget. In, in equal consideration. Okay, um, I now turning on to my position on the budget, I just want to say overwhelmingly grateful for departments and uh, for coming before us, our staff who have done an excellent and amazing job coordinating all this, holding our hearings and making space for all this. STLDV who, who has been here throughout this entire process going off site with us after hours, really, really, really grateful to you all um, and to the committee for the endless hours that we've spent kind of pouring over the city's budget. This has been extremely instructive and I think helpful not only to this committee but to the departments and, and to the members of the public who've been paying attention. Um, I, you know, in, 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 in trying to come up with my recommendations um, as budget chair, um, you know, it's been a very sobering year. Uh, this is the first year since I've been down here that our revenue projected for this coming year is roughly equal to the revised revenue estimates from the previous year. We're seeing, uh, we're projecting almost no growth and that's based on, um, you know, uh, Paul Payne's uh, projections and a pending downturn in our economy. Um, and it doesn't even include the uh, projected population loss and other things that are taking place. So it's a sobering time for our city and in a budget sense. And I think um, this is setting us up, this committee, for the work we need to be doing moving forward uh, to looking at the long-term uh, financial well-being of our city and, and, and where our revenues are gonna come from moving forward as we, especially as we consider increasing budgets to certain departments, um, you know, how that looks in a long-term sense if we're seeing no growth in our, in our income. We know that our pension costs are rising, our, our cost of health care and other things that are outside of our direct control are gonna continue to increase as is the, 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 the cost of doing business and inflation. 
Um, so I had a very hard time figuring out, uh, you know, w what to make recommendations for. I'll also say, as a city with a $1.3 billion budget, um, these considerations that we are considering are very small in comparison. Often what we end up doing down here is arguing at the margins of a very, very large budget. Um, that is really the only thing we're able to do with the short amount of time that we're, we're, we're given instead of being able to look more holistically at as a budget and as the, as the uh, function process and organization of the city. Of course, um, most of that work is done by the mayor's office and outside of what we could even consider as our purview um, as a legislative branch. But I just want to remind the committee that these, the amounts that we're looking at are very, very small in comparison to the overall city budget. That being said, <clears throat> there's some areas that I would like us to consider trying to find funds for either in this budget or uh, through reallocation of ARPA dollars. They're very small amounts. Um, one of them was highlighted by uh, Alderwoman Boyd, um, the down street lights, the fact that we're waiting right now on average of six months when a, when a, when a, when a street light uh, gets felled to be able to replace that. Um, you know, it would cost $200,000 for us to get up to speed on that and be in a position where we could replace those fairly immediately. And I think street lights are one of the, one of the uh, things that citizens <laughs> rely on to get in and out of their homes at night and and just expect it as a general public safety measure. Um, so I think to, to fill that would be very important. The other one um, is our pothole fund. Um, they requested um, allocation of a million dollars for the materials to fill our potholes. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the fact that we did not fully fund that pothole fund is is just sort of mind-blowing to me, given the vast number of my of potholes that we have. Um, they were looking for an extra $200,000 to make the pothole fund whole, and I think we ought to find $200,000 to fill the potholes. Um, those were two very, very small asks. I'll also weigh in that, um, you know, it was, it is, it is, um, uh, I think many members of the committee agree that ha not having a receptionist for a health department is a huge strain for that department. It's, it's um, I, I have to say, you know, I mean, seeing that we're adding administrative staff to the Board of Aldermen, um, uh, two secretary, or at least on the line item to the president of the office without having a single receptionist for the entire health department um, causes me great um, consternation. And um, I, I'd like to see us figure out how to, how to provide that for that department. Um, I agree with um, the older woman from the uh, ward on the left, one um, with um, the sewer lateral issue being a major concern. I'm hopeful that we can find a path uh, to funding that through additional fees that we can consider for the sewer lateral program. Um, it is a money in, money out sort of thing, and, and, you know, but if we can't find it in this budget, I'm willing to do that work to try to find that. Um, the tree removal um, that you brought up as well is also very important. These trees are falling down in our parks. Um, and the right of way on people's vehicles, and it's often, um, you know, incumbent upon a, a resident to turn them in, and they are a big danger. So I agree with that. Lastly, I mean, um, the STL TV folks, you guys are working with some of the um, jankiest equipment. Um, I have um, had the pleasure of having to deal with these microphones and stuff like that. You know, I mean, we 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 really are extremely indebted to your services through COVID. Um, here we are, you know, moving you through. We just want to make sure you're whole there. Um, and something that we didn't talk about, but I did want to uh, re just mention. Our special events department has one person and a part-time secretary. We, we rely on special events you know, to bring people. Uh, we have so many big parades and, and events throughout our year that really generate a lot of revenue and general, generate a lot of interest. And I hear over and over and over again from members of the public um, and organizers that navigating through special events um, and through other city departments is incredibly burdensome. And we have talked about for years increasing increasing that budget um, and providing a second person to help kind of navigate through that so that smaller events without the manpower can get their legs up and kind of get going and, 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 be, and be a valuable part of our city. Long term, um, you know, you guys are going to hear me talk about 
some of the same things I talk about all the time, but um, you know, when thinking about how we're sort of discussing the margins of the budget, we haven't talked about some of the big ticket items. That looks like a 50-50 sidewalk program that doesn't require residents to pay 50% of a public infrastructure piece of sidewalk. Um, the result of a, of, a, of a program like that that requires input from the public is a very, very um, uh, it, uh, unequal distribution of sidewalk investment because um, so many residents um, in different parts of our city but also um, in in um, in uh, non home or home uh, owner occupied uh, business uh, residents don't have adequate sidewalks because the folks owning their properties especially the vacant building owners are not investing in their sidewalks so Big picture, I think we should be thinking about how to fully fund a sidewalk program that would increase mobility and accessibility and an infrastructure and a street department um, that um, that is funded. One of the other areas, in addition to public safety, I think we should acknowledge so many members of the public that came out um, to, to discuss the, bu the budget did acknowledge the public, uh, excuse me, did, it, did, did it acknowledge the public safety uh, um, um, requests um, that we've mentioned here today, but many other members of the public discuss the ward capital and how it is a completely inadequate amount of money and way to just to invest in our infrastructure and thinking bigger picture than just a couple hundred thousand dollars here and there. We need to be thinking about how do we fully fund a street and, and mobility department that focuses beyond just cars, but integrates into it public transit, um, pedestrians and bicycles and other modes of transit because we are seeing a pedestrian fatality rate in St. Louis three times the national average and the overwhelming majority of folks hit or injured or killed by vehicles are in lower income communities and this is completely unacceptable. We need to figure out a path to fully funding a street and mobility department and that looks like tens of millions of dollars a year. So these are some big picture items and then of course City Tow, I'll talk about it again just because we've only increase their budget over the last couple of years by like 1% and we seriously have 700 vehicles littering our city streets right now and know where to put them in a city that has an enormous amount of vacant property. It's just totally unacceptable to me. So those are big picture items that we as this, as this committee could not through this process start to address because they're just too big to contemplate through this type of process. But I want us to continue to think about those things and to work towards solutions for them in the coming year so that this time we can have a larger amount of input on the city's budget and talk about how we can fix some of those sort of what I would say structural problems with the city's budget. And with that, um, you know, uh, um, the, uh, that kind of, that's my perspective on the city's budget. So I'll turn it over as I have done for everybody else to comments or questions from the committee. Alderwoman Boyd. Uh, thank you. I just think this year has been kind of kooky because of elections and the, the rush, rush, rush. And so, I've always said all the time that I sit on uh, the Budget of Ways and Means, whatever you want to call it today, committee. Uh, we need to start earlier because I think that's, and it, it helps, especially people that are new to the whole process so they can learn and read and understand the budget. And I just don't think people realize how much uh, the amount of reading that we have to do. <laughs> because if you never read in your life and you are an older person, you will learn to read because you have to educate yourself on what's going on and, and to know what's going on within the community that you service so you can educate your constituents. So the, uh, the budget process is very detailed and people need to listen and look because when you, you know, pulling stuff and taking stuff and giving stuff, you have to look at where it's coming from, what you're doing. And we do have a lot of departments that are underfunded. It, it's a lot of departments in this city. And as a city, we're so far behind. And so I get that, I agree with that. And things, we need to look at things differently. And the chair brought up a lot of points that, you know, I had been thinking about that those departments need to be looked at in more detail to say how can we help 
to leverage these budgets and make sure that they're being accommodated for the needs. And you won't get everything you need on your budget or in your department, but we can start looking at everything differently, not just one department. We should look at all departments differently and say, realistically, what should we be doing as a city? for this department and how this department, how we can support these employees. And the employees need to have input on it. They need to have say so on what you could do better for their departments. So I just think as this committee, we need to, uh, like I said, start earlier. I, I've never been a person last minute. That, that I just think that's just totally unprofessional to continuously keep doing things at the last minute and that doesn't work for me. So I've always been an advocate about starting early so we can make sure everybody's on point. So I just wanna thank everybody that has been here and that's been coming. And uh, I think we have uh, a lot of work to do because if we're gonna be on this budget committee for the next time, we need to start like yesterday, start working on it. So that's just where I'm at, thank you. Alderman Boyd, Alderwoman Schweitzer. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the comments and I, I couldn't agree more with Alderman Boyd that basically as soon as this budget's done, it's time to start figuring out the next one and maybe being a little bit, uh, you know, just because we, there's so many decisions and legislation that goes through the Board of Aldermen that's obviously going to affect the budget. Uh, so, you know, when we're thinking about the position that we're in now and what that looks like a year from now, um, setting the people who are in our seats, whether it's us or whether it's the committee looks a little different than who knows um, if it'll, you know, we'll add people or whatever. But um, it, it, I, I agree that that's, that's what we should be thinking um, ahead. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I appreciate uh, Alderman, uh, Chairwoman Spencer bringing up the 50-50 programs, funding of streets. Um, those are some of the things that are, that are really important. The street lights, I know that we had a large allocation of, for street light uh, improvements in ARPA funds. Um, the last I had known, those parts had not been ordered and I, I spent a lot of time talking with the administration about um, street lights and what, uh, how lighting should look going forward and what kind of, you know, Kelvin temperature and all of those like detail things that I think, you know, we get into with our various committees. Um, but we do have it in the budget for uh, ARPA funds to cover street lights as far as, as I, I remember voting. Um, and that, uh, that's the good. LED lights. LED lights, so you're talking about what? So the, the, the issue I was talking about was brought up in, in the streets committee or when the streets department was here. Um, when a street light falls, Got it. okay, and there's a there, to replace that. So Jamie Wilson followed up to an e with an email to us indicating that right now we have a budget of two hundred forty-seven thousand dollars allocated to replacing street lights, but there's like seventy. There's a long list of like seventy-five that are down throughout the city. So they're oh, only exactly. tacking them in order to get up to speed and get whole with that list would need about another 200, 220,000 and then they could just farm that out and then they would be at a zero point so that they could just replace them as they get falled. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I, I was confused with that. You were talking about the lights no. in particular. No, the, the, the ones I that get like it. hit by a car yes, or, no, I you know, agree with you. I agree with you. so okay. old they just fall off, fall over. And that's when it's up to us to think about, okay, well, if we do want to fund all of those things, where are we going to find the money? Yeah. Um, and that's why I suggested the things I did. Um, and uh, I hope that we are able to find places to cut in ways that allow for the trees to be cut down, the lights to be um, on, um, very literally the lights to be on in our city. Um, and uh, I did mention sewer lateral uh, improvements and funds there. Um, you know, the, the fact that we're paying contractors who did that work this past year out of emergency funds for next year, waiting, they're waiting to be paid, um, means that we're gonna be even further behind uh, instead of getting through any routine work in that program. And for those of you who I'm sure have had constituents like I have who call me up and, and tell me the situation they're in when those lines break, I mean, that is not a situation I want to let have anyone in, anyone in our city be in uh, if we can move some money to that position. So. I am looking forward to seeing what people recommend cutting, and I do think 
that it's important um, going forward to think about, again, the revenue, how much money is coming in, where we can find places to improve that. Um, the sewer lateral program is a $28 insurance fee. Um, I'm not sure how often that's charged, but I know when talking, they, they had mentioned it didn't have been updated. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it goes into a uh, bill. Right. Um, but I, I had remembered them saying it hadn't been increased maybe since the 90s or was it yeah. the 80s? So 80s. There's, there's some of that that, you know, is similar to the, the water division in terms of, you know, how often are these fees really looked at and what makes sense and what people need to pay. And the streets department had talked to me, at least one member of the streets department had talked to me it, about having the 50-50 program be similarly feed and as the sewer, sewer lateral program is so that it's on the bill and people are paying it and then that way each building can, can you know, their sidewalks can get fixed when it's their time to get fixed as opposed to the 50-50 program, which um, really doesn't, doesn't work. If people, uh, yeah, we can go in, that's a lot to go into and I really look forward to having that, some of those discussions in the Public Infrastructure and Utilities um, Committee because I, I think those are some of the things that are most important to our, to our city residents. So um, I, I appreciate the time and, and you pointing out some of those big needs. Thank you. Thank you. Alder Woman Zonye. Um, I really want to just thank all of our, you know, support staff. I've gotten to see you all just work tremendously, um, re very responsive to emails and even accommodating our switch to, you know, originally meeting here in Kennedy Room to going out to the community meetings and just going above and beyond to, you know, accommodate us and reminding us when we might have forgotten an, an aspect. So just thank you for that. And then really thank, um, you know, my colleagues and committee members. Um, I feel like I have gotten to learn a lot from all of you all and seeing you all's perspective and I think um, you know when I first got the assignment and, and, and learned that we had to meet every single day I was like what could we possibly talk about every single day um, but you know because we went so much more and so much further into the process I've gotten to just learn a lot um, about different departments and what they are and feel much more informed to speak to you know constituents and community members about and neighbors about what this department does how this department functions and I think the common thing for me is you know as we said before it seems like our city is so full of so many, you know, antiquated, outdated processes, and we're all struggling with, you know, understaffing. So I really hope as we move forward, and, and what I do like about the budget and, you know, the personnel director and Comptroller Green, I like that it seems like when we were able to lift up things, people were receptive of what we lift up, and many of them were already familiar with the issue and working on moving forward. So I look forward to us bringing City Hall into 2023 in the 21st century. Um, and also, I, I like the resolution that we did as a budget committee where it charges us to, it kind of helps us to see what our agenda is and, and what our goal is. And I'll certainly be looking into whatever we can do to get additional uh, streams of income. But also, I hope we'll also be mindful of other things that we need to do differently as far as like reimagining public safety and um, just, really moving forward and, and evolving as a, as a city. And I think this is a great position to, to do that in. Alderwoman, Alderman Aldrich. Oh. It is Pride Month, you know, I may take it. Um, <laughs> uh, first, I've, uh, I, I think I've already said just my appreciation. This feels like it's graduation as we're wrapping up and getting done with this. Appreciation to uh, you, Madam Chair, my colleagues, to the staff, to STL TV. Um, this has really been very informative to uh, learn some critical departments within our city and to uh, meet a lot of the great directors and people that, you know, run our city on a little bit of uh, resources and support that they do. It is um, honorable to be able to um, work for our constituents, but also to be able to work uh, with our directors and with our staff people to try to make uh, the city of St. Louis be better and in the role that we have as all the people to try to do that. So I'm very honored to even be sitting in this chair and to be able to work with each and every one of you to figure out how we can, uh, you know, we, we got different ways of getting there, but what I can say is we all want to see our city improve. Um, I think a lot of the things, as this is your um, recommendations-ish, Madam Chair, I think a lot of the things that um, you, you brought up were, are, are things that we've 
probably should be investing in, such as a receptionist. I think we can probably even go further in the heart, de uh, in the heart department, in the health department with um, some more staff. Um, I think, you know, the 50-50 have definitely been an issue that uh, has been talked about way before I even got down here and the importance of that. I do think we need to look at war capital. I think, you know, and until we figure that situation out, I do think we need to look at it in an equitable way, um, knowing that other wards uh, need a little bit more um, love and support um, compared to uh, other part of our neighborhoods. I will say, uh, you know, I think my, you know, I know we all took the time to look at decreases, uh, Madam Chair, and I know you just talking about increases. Um, I don't know what that will look like if our, our task is to send something to ENA that has a decrease and you don't have that. And I don't know if, um, you know, I, I would, how to vote on something to increase with like a, a no decrease. I think that is, that is really our, 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 Thing that we can do is decrease. I mean, we can make recommendations. I think that's what we're all doing. But I would love to see um, maybe if you have ideas of where decreases is. And, um, you know, I want to echo the old woman from the 7th Ward and saying I hope, you know, we as a committee can really, uh, you know, as the public has mentioned to us, that took the time out of their day to sit at Cherokee Street and to sit at uh, Herbert Hoover Boys and Girls Club, take into account a lot of things that they said, such as war capital, but also how do we reimagine what public safety look like in the city of St. Louis? We've been doing the same thing and the same results, and it's time that we, you know, try to reimagine ways that we can really invest in people, invest in housing, invest in healthcare, invest in police officers, um, and support our police officers in a way that has not been the way we've been doing it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll just to, just to answer that on the, uh, it's my, we do have the authority to make cuts. This body, this board, you know, we don't have the authority per se to make additions. Uh, we do have the ability to make recommendations and talking to the budget director, um, you know, we can make recommendations on where those cuts could come from, or we can make recommendations on additions and, and leave that to the infinite wisdom of the Board of ENA. Um, but, um, I, you know, so I was pointing out some of those pieces that I want to see us handle. Um, you know, I, as, I, as I kind of indicated when Alderwoman Schweitzer was kind of su suggesting us taking a look at our own budget, um, you know, I, I am inclined to feel that, you know, um, you know, it, it's such a large increases in the Board of Aldermen um, while we've reduced the number of aldermen um, kind of, you know, something that uh, causes me some consternation for sure, um, you know, especially when so many other departments are hurting and, and really needing um, resources. So um, I, I think we especially I'm really grateful for all of the uh, robust discussion today. Um, and I think, you know, the path through here would be to do some of the additional due diligence that this, the committee members have uh, identified we need to do and then come back tomorrow, have those, have uh, discussion on the specific items that we each want to see and, and, and we'll, we will go from there. I would also say, I, I know this is not specific for the budget committee, but I know the charter commission is coming. Speaking of things that are very shocking to me, I can't believe we only have the authority to cut and not the authority to add, and the charter commission will be meeting, and I think that would be something worthwhile for us to lift up um, as a possible recommendation that that commission should be making. Second. So many things in the commission, the charter could be revisited from a, from a broad perspective. And so many of these things, like ward capital, are set by current uh, law. You know, when we pass the sales tax that uh, we use for ward capital, um, you know, there's some very specific ways in which we can spend those funds. So thinking through, to me, um, I think having ward capital is helpful for neighborhood investments, um, and we need a street fund <laughs> and all those other funds outside of the little measly pieces of, um, you know, community neighborhood uh, uh, investments that we currently have. So. Um, with that, um, okay, so tomorrow I would, I am requesting that all members of the committee come prepared with uh, any amendments that they want to present and have voted on in committee before going back to the board, board of Alderman. I did request that we go to Zoom tomorrow, but um, I thought it would be helpful for members of the public who could tune in, but I, I didn't hear back directly from the clerk on that. 
Oh, we did? Oh, I'm so sorry. Did he, did he change it to Zoom? Thank you so much. I didn't see that uh, response. So uh, we are going to be convening tomorrow via Zoom. So um, these can be handled um, electronically to be emailed out. I guess we can send, those, send these to the clerk in the morning prior to the meeting, if that's OK, unless there's another suggestion on that front. OK. Thanks again to everyone. Um, I, with that, uh, we've gone through all of our um, items on the agenda. I'll entertain a motion to motion adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Hearing no objections, the budget and public. We, have we did not have minutes. No, they were not presented. We did excuse Tom. Yes. Uh, with that, hearing no objections, the budget and public employees committee is adjourned.